Commission. The commission's here before you tonight to work together with all of you property owners, neighbors, and architects to continue the tradition that was established nearly 40 years ago in this community. That tradition is a review process that allows community members to work together to preserve the qualities and unique character that make Lake Forest a special community. The City of Lake Forest is committed to conducting open and democratic meetings, and to achieve this goal, meeting procedures have been adopted by the Commission. A copy of the procedures is available at the back of the room on each agenda, and it's the intent of the Commission to help manage the development and growth of the City of Lake Forest with a keen sense of preserving the historic structures and open space in the City for all its present and future residents. Our goal is to move each petition before us tonight through the review process as quickly as possible while balancing the interests of the petitioners, neighboring property owners, and the larger community. And we'll start this evening like we always do with the uh, introduction of the commissioners. Susan Atkinson. <coughs> John Travers. <coughs> Bill Ransom. Kirk Peretz. Robert Elphi. Thanks, folks. And uh, let's see, I believe we have no housekeeping items, so that gets us right to business. Uh, first uh, residential petition this evening is a consideration of a request for certificate of appropriateness approving demolition of an existing residence located at 287 West Laurel Avenue and a replacement residence. Uh, so uh, let's ask if anyone has any ex parte conflict on this. Mm -hmm. And I see none, so if you folks want to come on up and tell us what it's all about, that'd be great. Good evening, my name is Matt Frecco. Uh, thank you to the HPC for the opportunity tonight to present our plans for 287 West Laurel. Um, unfortunately, my wife Katie is unable to attend tonight because she's out of town. Uh, but Katie and I have been residents of Lake Forest for 10 years. Uh, and we, uh, shortly after we moved in, we really fell in love with Lake Forest. It's a wonderful community. We have three children ages 10, seven, and five, uh, all of whom were enrolled in Lake Forest schools. And uh, I run a business that's local here. We have no plans to move the business. Uh, so as we become attached and connected to the community, our family's plan really is to remain residents of Lake Forest for the long term. Uh, several years ago, after outgrowing our existing home, we began to search for our next home. Uh, and after um, looking at dozens of homes over a period of several years, uh, we found 287 West Laurel on the market. And we quickly realized that this was really the property <coughs> of our dreams. Um, as you can see from this first, let's see, I'll try to, from this aerial shot here, there's a couple key elements to the property which we found to be unique and attractive to us. First, the private, quiet, secluded location we think is, is really unbelievable. The private lane with no through traffic is very attractive. Um, we love the mature natural setting with the direct connection to the open lands to the east. We think the golf course to the west provides enhanced privacy and beauty for the property. And then also the gorgeous architecture of the surrounding homes we find really attractive. In particular, the homes to the immediate north and south are quite lovely. So all rolled into one to be part of uh, uh, this enclave within Lake Forest was really, uh, really enticing to us. So after purchasing the, purchasing the property, we hired Northworks and, and Hare Shout to help us develop plans. Um, what we really want to do here is create a legacy asset for our family uh, and hopefully we'll stay in our family for multiple uh, generations. There's one element to the property that I'd like to address. You can kind of see it. There's a pond uh, located uh, on the property and our plans, you'll note that they call for the removal of this pond and there's really three reasons why. As parents of young children, we feel the pond is a significant safety hazard for our family and we'd like to remove it from a safety perspective. Uh, second, when we inspected the pond last summer, it was sort of in so-so in condition. There was stagnant water and the immediate area around the pond had become a breeding ground for bugs and mosquitoes and so we'd like to remove that element of the property. Um, and then we studied the pond, the Shout team studied it with an engineer and we made the determination that it was man-made. So one of our key design <coughs> landscape design objectives is to really restore and enhance the natural beauty of the property. So by removing the man-made pond, we kind of accomplish one of our key uh, landscape design objectives. So um, 
with that, I'd like to turn it over to Austin, who I think is going to be uh, uh, reviewing our architectural design plans, and then Doug will cover the landscape elements after that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Austin Dupre. Uh, I'm the architect for the project. And uh, like Matt said, uh, it's, it's a wonderful part of Lake Forest uh, right off the Green Bay uh, Historic uh, District corridor. And I wanted to start by uh, delving into uh, <coughs> the existing structure and the demolition request. Thanks. Um, and talk a little bit about uh, Ralph uh, Huzzig and his, um, uh, his work in the Chicago area and then up in the North Shore and then ultimately at Laurel Avenue. And you can see some of the press and images up on the left, uh, starting with the Aragon Ballroom, um, uh, built in 1926. And I'd say the majority of uh, their success, or excuse me, his success was with Boyd Hill um, uh, from the early 20s until about 1931 when they separated. Um, they graduated from uh, Cornell together in 1919, uh, and that's when they began practicing together in Chicago. Um, Aragon Ballroom on the upper left, this Moorish Revival style ballroom was really uh, what they're widely recognized for. <coughs> um, uh, then down to the lower left, we have uh, 1540 Lakeshore Drive, uh, which is a Gothic Revival uh, high-end residential tower uh, on Lakeshore Drive. Uh, and then to the lower right here, um, we have 2543 Deer Park Drive. Uh, this is in Highland Park, uh, 1926, again still with Boyd Hill. Uh, and then above that, 605 Sheridan Road, 1925 again with, with Boyd Hill. Um, these two examples to the right that I'm showing here are more uh, recent examples from the mid-30s, um, the upper right being a, a project uh, that I actually worked on for two years uh, by Boyd Hill. Um, this is over on Crabtree Lane. Um, uh, certainly beautiful colonial revival uh, Georgian style home. Uh, and then a house in Winneka built in 1936 um, by Ralph uh, <coughs> And this was really one of the last uh, significant structures I was able to find uh, through research. Um, I did uh, two years ago when I came before the commission, uh, we did present this project and the demolition request. Um, and I believe there was a request for more information. Um, and since then, uh, and more recently, obviously at that point I was talking to Art Miller uh, about the project and about the demolition request. Um, and since then, I have consulted with uh, a local architectural historian who uh, Lake Forest has used quite a bit and who we're working on um, in our office on four different projects with her and, and showed her the project. She's very familiar with Ralph Huzzig and uh, agreed with us that uh, she felt that the example um, here at 287 West Laurel, although um, is signed off on by Ralph Huzzig is late enough in his career where uh, really there are no distinguishing characteristics that make this uh, worthy of preservation. Certainly it's a pleasant house was the way she phrased it, but uh, not architecturally significant. And it, in addition to that, it's um, I believe the, uh, the Green Bay Road Historic District was established in 1995. This is not listed as a con con uh, contributing structure. Um, and I wanted to take you through a couple of slides just to refresh people's memory and, uh, and show people who weren't here two years ago a little bit more detail of the house. Um, and really, if you saw these up close, which I believe these were provided in your packet, you could see that a lot of these architectural details um, were um, not, not done uh, to a high level of execution. Um, there are many areas in the house where we feel like there have been adaptations and additions. Um, since it was built in 1955, I went through all the building permit records, and the only building permits that I could find were one for the pool, one for the pond, um, and then one for a detached garage. But 
Um, it's evident in the photographs that there were many alterations besides those that were permitted um, and difficult to distinguish uh, maybe what was original and uh, what has been added. Uh, these last um, photographs just uh, highlight, I think, uh, the dilapidated nature of the, the pool area and pool house, and then some of these, uh, the outbuilding, uh, this detached garage uh, built in the late 70s. Um, so I'm sure there'll be questions, more questions about the demolition request, but that's a brief overview. Um, let's see, and like Matt was saying, um, we really want to respond to the existing architecture on Laurel and Green Bay and in the historic district. And sorry for the dark slide here, but uh, this is superimposed. Uh, here you can see the existing tennis court and the uh, man-made retention pond. We're proposing to remove both of those, and Doug will speak more about the restoration of this uh, part of the lot, uh, this western edge of the lot. Um, so we get into the site plan. Um, we're proposing uh, an approximate 8,000 square foot house uh, above grade um, with a detached pool, pool house. Um, this has obviously been working on this project or on the site for two and a half years um, with uh, the new design for this new family. Uh, one of the things we've been able to do uh, working in conjunction with Herr Shout is turn the garage so it does not face uh, Laurel Avenue, which is a difference between the last design and this one. And I think uh, the siding in the house has been pushed farther west uh, because we did eliminate that tennis court, which was a hindrance in previous schemes. Um, so I think in terms of a, a massing perspective from along Laurel, um, uh, we've tried to minimize that. Uh, we're probably running out of time here, so I'll just run through the slides. But we've collected images and distributed images of uh, existing houses in the neighborhood uh, with the proposed elevation really as a derivative of this very common theme of uh, colonial revival style in the neighborhood. Uh, again, looking at an immediate neighbor to the north, looking at the scale proportion of the house and um, hoping that this will fit in with the scale and proportion of the neighborhood. Um, more detailed elevations um, that have been distributed uh, reveal that this is uh, really intended to look like a Pennsylvania farmhouse, uh, colonial revival home with uh, New York uh, field stone as the, as the material used for the main masking of the house with clabbered siding uh, for the outstretching wings and outbuildings. Um, the north facade with the three garage bays, uh, again with doors intended to resemble uh, carriage house style doors. Uh, the rear elevation here, um, again symmetrical massing, uh, intended to give uh, prominence to the main core of the house with the use of stone and then the feeling that uh, this house has evolved and settled over time uh, with smaller additions in the same vernacular. Um, the south elevation, um, I've actually spoken directly to the neighbors uh, to the south of this property and they've seen the plans and uh, feel this would be an enhancement in terms of their view of the property. Um, elevations of the proposed pool house, again uh, settling in with this kind of colonial revival eclectic style that's uh, found in the neighborhood and all around Lake Forest. Uh, just a rendering a uh, nighttime shot of that pool house. Um, a perspective of the front facade of the home and then just an evening perspective to have show neighbors uh, in the neighborhood what they would be seeing come home at night. Trying to minimize the appearance of scale and bulk by, uh, by use of plantings but then also minimizing the scale of uh, these adjacent wings of the house. Um, lastly, Wanted to just show you uh, more detailed photographs of proposed materials of this uh, Pennsylvania flagstone wall for the main mass in the house, which would extend into the landscape. Uh, Vermont black slate roof, which is down in front of you, uh, the sample there. Uh, painted clabbered siding, half round copper gutters, 
uh, full painted wood shutters and uh, highly detailed painted wood trim throughout. And with that, I will uh, hand it over to Doug. Good evening, hi. Uh, interesting, uh, very interesting piece of ground in that it um, is really sandwiched between two, two uh, extremely um, beautiful piece, parcels of land, east and west, uh, the golf course and, and the open lands parcel. Um, and, and, and I think it's our intention to, uh, the house is sort of sits on a podium of land to a degree and it has a couple of really large trees that we'd like to save. Um, and then there's a, a number of trees in the, in the western portion that are, are, are weed trees, not even uh, on the open lands list. Um, but, but as you can see, we just have a, 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 a very, um, right now it's a U-shaped drive and we're just gonna go with a front loaded uh, axial driveway, auto court, and then again, parking and, and uh, any staffing cars and things like that to the back. Uh, which, will, which will diminish the garage door. Um, this, this would have some lawn in front. There's all, currently a hedge that runs across the front of the house. We'd keep that, uh, add more trees, uh, some uh, evergreen, possibly even native uh, cedar type of evergreen, and then a, a large lawn, um, a stone wall. And so this is, this is more formal in front. And then we go through a, a gate uh, orchard, uh, crab apple orchard, or possibly even edible apples. Uh, a, a terrace uh, and a pool. So basically from here on, uh, this is sort of the really design portion of the property. And then once you step down off grade, <coughs> so there'll be like three or four foot down, and we do have a, have a, a licensed uh, uh, certified civil engineer we're working with. This would, all, this would be a certain amount of play lawn. This is where the tennis court is currently in this spot, and here's where the, the man-made pond is. So what my hope is, is to allow this really naturalistic uh, landscape from the rear uh, and not play up that this is a property line at all, and even with our neighbors, uh, is to blur this whole idea of property line here and let the, the, the naturalized landscape run up into the, into the view of the home, which is one of the reasons they bought the house. The, uh, the pond, uh, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Yeah, there we go. So anyway, here's front load uh, material. And obviously we're, we're just at the, at the master plan schematic phase here, so um, this is why we're in here to see you. But this would be the orchard feel. Uh, you might have some taller grass, the, the natural border to the south. This is actually what there's in the neighbors. Uh, it's not exactly this, but it, it's that kind of character. It's not native, but we would allow this to come into our western, uh, our southern border. Um, and then as we get to the rear of the property, the, the back uh, to a third, it would look more of this nature, native, um, get rid of the, the, the crummy trees, bring in some better trees for the long haul, and hopefully get some more vegetation on the ground. It's mostly a lot of weeds, and, uh, and, that, and so we'd like to get it to be more of a, uh, uh, so they could handle it. The, the big problem here is the, is the pond and the runoff, because to the east is the open lands, and that water comes off off that and runs right down through this property. It all goes to the watershed, the Skokie uh, watershed there. And, and so the water all comes through the site and on, on the neighbors. And so I think everybody is worried that this pond that's in there is detaining a tremendous amount of water. And if we take it out, it's gonna be a flood. Well, we've looked at it pretty closely and uh, I'll let this, but right now it, it's a man-made pond and, and basically they scraped some soil from around the site and created this dam and if you and, and cut and fill exercise with the civil engineer found that if we take the, the dam off of the pond, we actually aren't, we're increasing the wetland potential of that site. So the pond itself is, is, is sort of a, it seems like it's doing a lot of work, but it isn't because the, also the outfill flow from it, uh, there's, it holds a bunch of stagnant water and then it, it's, it basically, if it fills up, it, it doesn't have that much bounce. So if we take it out, we're actually going to get rid of the berm and the dam we're actually increasing the wetland potential of, of the site. Now that doesn't mean to say that we don't want to continue to work with the neighbors, but obviously we need to meet all the code and, and work with, with uh, the city um, so that you know, we're not running water on anybody's property and everything else. But I think there's a real interest in working with the neighborhood at large 
to make this a win-win because -win, once you get past the property line to the west of the fr uh, of our client that goes into the golf course and that type of thing there's what there's pit trails to the other open lands properties there's all sorts of uh, uh, gullies and, and ditches that have been made by the neighbors over the years to run the water through there and quite honestly it's it's also shaded that those those are now just bare dirt I walked back in there this winter um, and so it would be nice if we could get some, some, some more vegetation in there and work with the neighbors to, to slow down the water as a whole, which I think everybody's worried about. Um, here's the pond, actually. It's, it's not, it's not a, a huge attribute, I would say. So uh, that's, that's sort of it. I think, I think it's really consistent with, 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 with uh, the beauty of the, and enhancing the beauty of, of, the, of the site and making it even, even better. Um, and, and hopefully it'll just sort of filter out into the, the greater landscape from the, to the west, north, and south. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, we have materials here as well for... All right. I'm sure we'll have some questions for you <coughs> regarding those. Uh, do we have a staff report on this uh, petition? Thank you, Chairman Peretz. Um, as was noted by the petitioner, um, the commission actually did review a request for a demolition and replacement structure back in 2011. Some of you may have been on the commission at that time. Um, the commission um, reviewed, similar to this, a conceptual um, plan for the, for the property and um, at that time um, really didn't have a lot of information on the demolition request and, and therefore requested that the commissioner come back with more complete architectural plans as well as uh, more information to support the demolition. Um, at that time, and, and again with this petitioner, that was with a different owner. This is a new owner that has come in, um, purchased the property, is working with the same architect. Um, the staff did suggest that um, a preservation consultant be enlisted to provide some input on, on the um, architectural significance of this particular house. Um, since the 2011 meeting, the petitioner has provided additional support in the form of research done by their firm and based on their um, experience with um, Boyd Hill and um, this particular architect um, and provided photographic documentation of other works pr done by the architect um, as well as detailed photographs of some of the um, architectural features of the existing house um, that may not um, be up to, the, um, up to par with other homes in the historic district. Um, so at this point, the, the petitioner is asking for input from the commission whether or not sufficient information has been provided um, to evaluate the demolition request. Um, if the commission finds that there is sufficient um, documentation for the demolition and to provide positive findings um, to support the demolition, um, then discussion and input on the replacement structure would be appropriate at that time, at this time. Um, certainly, if more discussion is needed on the demolition, if more information is, is requested by the commission, um, providing clear direction to the petitioner um, would be a good direction for this meeting. Um, I'll comment briefly on the replacement structure. We have um, had several discussions um, with the petitioner, um, primarily regarding the site plan. Um, there certainly is um, um, more work that needs to be put into the engineering aspect of the plan. We've heard from a lot of the neighbors with concerns for the drainage and the flow of water through the property. Um, based on the preliminary information that staff has reviewed, uh, the proposed plan appears workable. There, there's certainly nothing that says the pond can't be filled in. There does have to be um, mitigation on the property to allow for that to happen. And those really need to be worked out um, as the um, petitioner works with the civil engineer um, to develop those plans. Um, there are some comments in the staff report um, regarding um, the landscape character of the front um, commission input. Again, if, if the demolition request is supported and, and discussion occurs on the replacement structure, um, commission input is requested on, on the character of the landscaping in the front. Um, as proposed, um, there is a formal landscape plan that, that is compatible with the house um, but looking broadly at the neighborhood, um, the city arborist does recommend that some additional trees be um, installed in the front yard to maintain the more natural character of, of the Laurel Avenue streetscape. Um, with, with that, um, I'll pass it on to the commission for questions, and I'd be happy to answer any that you may have. Thanks. All right. Now is an opportunity for the commissioners to ask any questions of the staff or the petitioner. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Um, so Megan, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on the studies 
for the drainage because that seems like the big concern just for the neighbors and you said it's workable but based on what I mean how much work has been done to assess the impact of the pond you know how deep is the pond and you know how how big a deal is it really I don't have a lot of the the technical information to, to share with the Commission this evening um, we certainly know that there um, were some wetlands on the property we've got the petitioner has gone through the proper channels to identify the quality of those wetlands what could and what can and cannot occur on those um, with with the property on that um, portion of the lot um, and and the work that's proposed appears to be consistent with um, the regulating ordinance for that type of work um, we, we still have to review an actual plan to make sure that um, but that concept turns into a functional so landscape. Megan maybe um, since there was some concern from neighbors on this issue and it's actually not one of our criteria that we judge but it, it's a technical review by the city staff mm -hmm. maybe you could just for the folks that are listening and that are concerned with this talk about what the process going forward would be on that issue if sure. that how does that come to a resolution sure and and I actually um, the petitioner might have some additional input on this I know that they've reached out to the neighbors they've been talking about um, you know what what the issues are how can this plan help um, with the the overall broad issues of drainage in that area um, moving forward a, a drainage plan will be developed and reviewed by the city um, the through the permitting process um, that's that's part of a standard permit review um, we can invite the neighbors to review those plans and and provide input at appropriate times hmm. all right thanks so so then we could if we get comfortable with the demolition criteria and and the new design we could make it contingent upon that drainage plan actually you wouldn't need to make it con that that would be the normal requirement right. and it's it just not, would be normal it's yeah. not really a, 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 a one of the areas of purview that we have as a historic um, mm -hmm. Uh, so it, it wouldn't be a, st a staff condition it's, it's a requirement that was called out that it's a requirement by for any project okay. yeah. it's, a, it's a standard requirement for it for any building project certainly the Commission can identify that as um, a concern that should be addressed with so this so uh, and that might not be inappropriate but um, uh, just because we were to act on this one way or another the uh, the technical review could determine that the pond in fact has to stay or it has to be made larger it has to be turned into a uh, detention pond instead of a retention pond there's all kinds of technical ramifications to that that require really more detailed engineering for, and and we don't really have the yeah. expertise to impose those requirements on them, but the city does happily <laughs> so is that yeah that's okay. good. John I was wondering if I could ask a question sure. of staff yep. uh, relative to uh, a demolition and uh, as uh, sort of the second most junior person on the Commission I wanted to um, just pose this question to you uh, as uh, on the demolition uh, uh, petitions that uh, I've uh, that I've worked on before here uh, it seemed to me that uh, we had received a formal uh, written historic historical preservation consultants report and assessment uh, and uh, and then also in each case I believe we've received a structural evaluation from an independent structural engineer written in a formal report and uh, it had been my understanding that those documents were generally required for all demolition uh, applications under uh, section 51-6 C of the uh, of the ordinance and uh, and I had in my experience not being an architect or a historian had found those to be very useful and I think critical to both favorable and unfavorable action on those applications I note that those have not been provided with uh, this petition and what I wanted to ask you, and, and, and especially given that the architect involved is uh, Mr. Dupre, as uh, you know, pointed out to us, is is an architect of some note, having been involved in many important projects, and you know, responsible for, I think, 11 single-family residences in Highland Park that are deemed uh, significant, or uh, have been deemed significant, or or contributing from a historical standpoint. Would it be unreasonable for uh, the commission to 
ask for uh, those reports to be provided if this if the demolition aspect of this was continued I don't think it would be unreasonable to request that type of documentation it is a, a, a typical document that the Commission reviews for demolition requests um, I, I think more the preservation consultant um, less the structural um, evaluation um, the Commission's criteria is really focused on um, the the historical significance and, and less about whether or not the structure is um, structurally sound. I, may I follow up on the question? Follow up. Thank oh, you. I, I would, I'm interested in your last comment because I was thinking about uh, other projects we've looked at and sometimes there seems to be a balance because of course functionality is a critical goal <laughs> of the uh, commission, functionality uh, of these properties. Is is this? Not sure. I agree with that, but <laughs> just talking about the predicate, the begin, the uh, sort of prologue to the ordinance. Sure, go for it. Right? Uh, and so, uh, I, I think if I, I mean that is if a house is, yeah. uh, it would be very difficult well, to restore. A house. Let me uh, maybe I could shed some light on a couple of those items. I think um, with respect to this structural engineering report, I think the um, the intent of the ordinance for uh, providing that portion of it. And the reason why I think Megan is uh, a little less worried about that is, is that it could be an argument that um, a, a historic house is functionally obsolete, structurally obsolete even, if you will, and that's why the structural engineers. And we've physically had, depreciated. Physically depreciated, whatever you want to call it. We've had cases in the past, actually quite a few, <laughs> where we've been considering homes that would have otherwise been significant, but for the fact that they were so far gone, if you will. Okay. Now, no one's making that. Uh, claim for this home. Matter of fact, it's quite functional, and it says they say pleasant. If not, you know. Uh, so, so I don't think that there's the basis of the petition is is that it's structurally obsolete. Okay. So I would say there's no reason for anybody to come tell me it isn't because I don't need to know that. I know it is, in fact, fine. You could live in it. So that part of it, I think, you know, is kind of off the table. It's interesting to me with respect to the requirement or whether it is a requirement or not a requirement for um, a consultant. Uh, first of all, the, the, um, uh, I think that's the decision of the commission here as to whether or not we feel like we've been afforded enough information with respect to this house to form an opinion on whether or not there's a historic value to retaining the home or not. And so I think what the staff has done in their recommendation is, is they've looked at the information that's been presented. They've been able to conclude a recommendation based on that recommendation. They don't necessarily uh, expect us to agree or disagree with them, but that's just been their recommendation. So it's up to us. Um, they, we can waive that requirement anytime we want. It's just a question of whether we need more information or whether we don't. Um, so we have to decide. <laughs> <laughs> Other, I mean, at that point, I mean, isn't the criteria, you know, the standard for review of a demolition, you know, the five that we have here laminated? I mean, that's really our our criteria. And yeah, absolutely. The information presented, you can filter it through these five lenses to ascertain whether or not there's enough info or ask for more to jump in. Let's, uh, see if we can get through the Q&A portion. We have time for more deliberations on that subject. I think that it's appropriate to talk about that more. Um, do we have other questions for either the staff or the petitioner on either the existing home or the new home or? Well, I have uh, a question on demolition. Okay, there we go. Um, this probably goes to the petitioner, but staff could weigh in as well. I'm trying to understand all the information that was provided to make the determination that uh, that this meets the criteria for demolition. And I, 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 I jotted down a few things. I'm not sure if I have a complete um, recounting of what it is that was provided. And I heard that you spoke to a historic preservation consultant that you regularly uh, works on your projects. I don't know if that was Susan Benjamin or somebody else, um, but because we're not don't have a report on that, you know. Uh, I also see that you've given us detailed photographs of some detailing on the existing structure to show that you know maybe it isn't up to the quality of some other homes in the area. Um, 
Well, you also gave us photos of, of examples of the architect's other, um, yeah. other works. Besides those things, what other information was provided for you to make the determination that um, this doesn't meet the criteria for demolition? And, and, I, and I look at the, your statement of intent uh, with the, that was provided in the standards for demolition. And standard number one, the whole sum of it is we do not believe the existing house has historic, cultural, architectural, or archaeological, or what, what is that? Archaeological. Archaeological. Archaeological, archaeological <laughs> significance. I, and I, you know, then there's no other detail provided. I'm wondering what other detail you could, you could give us to help us make a determination. Because I'm not sure, based on what I was given or those things that I recounted, I can make that determination. So. So, so Austin, some color for you. If you come on up, because I think it's going to be a great answer to this question I would like to hear. But keep in mind, we have a mixed board of architects, laypersons. And I just showed that I don't have <laughs> that expertise. <laughs> I, I just demonstrated very well. So, right? so, uh, so that, that we're, it gives us some pause anytime we tear anything down. So we want to make sure we get it right. Uh, so we, a, a little more color on this subject, I think, was helpful. Sure, sure. Um, and, and definitely what I was trying to, um, I guess, um, uh, show the commission with the series of photographs and really the history of the architect's body of work is that this was really done at the very end of his career. Uh, I think three or four years before he moved to California. He actually died in Palm Springs, California in 1977. Um, this project was completed when he was in his late 50s. Um, it was completed, again, going back to um, kind of the highlight of his career in the 20s and 30s uh, before the uh, Depression uh, is really when you saw the great body of work out of Boyd Hill and Ralph Huzzig. Um, starting uh, at the beginning of the Depression, um, Huzzig and Boyd Hill separated in 1931. Um, Ralph Huzzig actually uh, dropped uh, the AIA in 1935. Um, and I think as the Depression wore on through the late 30s and into the early 40s, you really saw fewer and fewer of these more distinguished homes that you see on this page. <clears throat> and by World War II, uh, there was an absolute halt of construction of these beautiful colonial revival homes. Um, by 1955, when this house was completed, and I think it's worth to note that you know the the recession of 1953 was one of the worst, uh, even worse than the last recession that we went through. Uh, I think the GDP dropped by about 6.3 percent in one year in 1953. So, again, I'm just trying to highlight in the context of history, this house was constructed uh, after. Um, that kind of uh, renaissance of colonial revival construction was happening like forest and in the surrounding area. And I think it was built in a time when uh, there wasn't as much uh, care uh, put into the design. Because it, it's my personal belief that by the time this house was built, and there are others that have recently been demolished in the Highland Park of this era in the late 40s, early 50s, by the same architect that. Uh, I don't think uh, Ralph Huzzig was directly involved like he was during some of his uh, earlier works. And I think going back to a more recent example in Lake Forest, um, looking at a lot of the discussions that the commission went through on the Stanley Anderson house across from uh, the church, uh, I know there was some discussion there about getting a historic consultant involved, and I, I understand that that one was really... Um, you know, architects and a lot of other people looking at the, the work and saying it wasn't significant, although it was a significant architect. So I guess I'm relying on that overall narrative of uh, not sure the life the of this architect. We on that one, but. And, uh, <laughs> and then also just uh, conferring with staff and their general agreement that the, um, uh, I think the lack of, of architectural significance of the house that you see here uh, led us to think that uh, a full HIS study or a full uh, architectural study of this house 
which obviously would cost the owner uh, more money, uh, was not needed mm -hmm. for this house. And, and again, just a little background on our firm. Uh, we do a lot of historic preservation work. Um, that last uh, Boyd Hill house, uh, we were given uh, uh, an award from Lake Forest for the restoration of that house. So I certainly have uh, a lot of respect for these architects. And that's what I'm trying to demonstrate here. And I certainly have a lot of respect for the architectural heritage of Lake Forest, but I, I firmly believe that this, uh, this house is really not uh, worthy of, of further study. I think um, through consultation with our consultant, uh, through talking with uh, Art Miller a few years ago about this house and through general discussions, I don't feel I it's I just necessary. follow up on that really quick. Uh, it's noteworthy in this petition that there were no comments from the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation with respect to the demolition of this structure. Did you have any conversations? You said you talked to Art a little bit over the years on this. Uh, were there any interchange between you and the foundation on this particular uh, resubmission? If you uh, no, but I've I've really uh, I haven't run across anyone who's had a feeling that this is a contributing Understand. structure. Okay. Austin, you, I a, Austin, I have a question for you. you, you so you also mem you also mentioned that there was one permit for construction, but you thought that there was a fair amount of modification to the home. Can you just give us a summation of where this, the extent of the scope and you know what you feel like is is um, still uh, has the integrity of the original design? Sure, sure. Um, well, I guess there's a, a couple moments I can point to where I feel like there's been some significant modification uh, from the original structure. Uh, one of which is these uh, two smaller bay windows that you see at the front facade. Um, looks like they were built at different times out of scale with one another. Um, you know, obviously skylights and other things. Uh, this rear bay uh, at the rear of the house has been clad with aluminum. I believe that this roof is a modification uh, from the original roof with the alum uh, aluminum gutter. Uh, and aluminum siding. Um, uh, I also feel like this back porch um, has been modified from original. Um, could have been a sleeping porch at one time, but going up there now, uh, it's a fully conditioned space with a AstroTurf uh, floor. Um, I think when you walk through the interior, um, uh, the ceilings are eight foot tall. There's really no molding um, worth noting. Uh, it's it kind of represents this transitional time between kind of ranch homes and a more modern um, language of architecture and still trying to harken back to this uh, era of, um, of great colonial revival architecture in Lake Forest. And I think given the age of the architect when this was built, given the recessionary environment, and given some of the, the odd details uh, that we're seeing here, uh, we just do not feel it's uh, worthy of preservation. And what we're hoping to do is uh, create a house that really um, can hold its own against uh, some of the uh, more historic homes that are in this neighborhood. Okay. Can I ask a question to Mr. DeBrien? Sure. So uh, it seems as if you have uh, done a, quite a bit of study of this house and it has not been uh, reduced at this point uh, to, and you have a uh, historical consultant on staff uh, who- or Not on who staff, but <laughs> we're, we're working, I guess we were hesitant to engage someone formally and start paying another consultant. Obviously Matt's paying us, but mm -hmm. uh, we thought it would be uh, really self-evident. Right, so uh, my, my question to you was, uh, given that uh, you have this work done to date and you have someone who has been working with you on it at some level, would it be uh, unreasonable uh, given uh, the requirements of the ordinance and the usual practices here uh, to uh, ask you to reduce uh, that research uh, to a writing in the usual format? And, and, and if I and believe me, I, I have no intention of uh, mm -hmm. arguing anything with you, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. what causes uh, a pause for the uh, non-architect 
is that one looks at pictures of three properties in Highland Park, which are deemed historically significant, and they're really similar to this house. And, uh, and, and, and so not that they really are, but mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, providing the commission with a basis, you know, which is provided for us by ordinance mm -hmm. for making our decision, I, I think it would be useful to uh, reduce all of the work you've done to a writing. Right, and I actually have a list of of all the uh, houses in Highland Park that have been deemed uh, significant, and they're all um, built before 1937. Um, actually, 1939 was the last one at 290 Woodland Road that was deemed significant. Um, but all the other ones, um, there was one in 1941 that's contributing and then the last one uh, at 2589 Sheridan Road, which is a similar ranch colonial revival, is non-contributing, and that one was just. Um, Are these homes that this architect did? Yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So I've actually, I mean, I, looking at the timeline of the architect, I think is one of the more important things to do because it's not just, I mean, there are many architects uh, in this community, like Jerome Cerny, who obviously did a, a, a massive body of work, but at a certain point, his practice was handed over to somebody else. And I think you saw a decline in the, uh, in the richness of his work. I think reducing that narrative to writing could be, uh, provide an excellent basis for making a, a determination about the demolition. I have a question for the staff. Uh, can you comment on what additional information we have since 2011 when this demolition was continued that uh, you know we didn't have back in 2011 um, the more extensive photographs of the body of work of the architect the the information that was just um, noted for the record at the meeting here by the architect is is new research that they've done and, and more time put into understanding um, the timeline for the architect and, and the different types of architecture that they produced. So just to add some color to this, I'm, I'm not sure who was here in 2011 besides me, I Susie know. was, mm -hmm. and Jim. So uh, I believe, Austin, that petition came for information. It wasn't, it wasn't for action uh, the last time this came, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a fairly sparse package for that reason. I think there was an exploration going on both by the owner or the prospective owner at the time, um, and frankly by uh, Austin himself in terms of what kind of solution would work well at this location, and, what, and uh, frankly you were getting into it, you know, you were trying to understand what the constraints were. So it was a fairly sparse uh, package. We weren't very, we weren't afforded very much information. Uh, this is substantially more information than we received in 2011. Yeah, so, but we did not take action, and we didn't. Because I think we were pretty um, unsure a bit, and what I'm getting now from you, Austin, really kind of states your case to me that you did do your homework and this is a candidate for demolition based on that conclusion. I mean, I think you even said that this probably was done by a staff person in his office and not necessarily the architect, and I think you clearly demonstrated that if you look at the difference between what we saw in 2011 and now. Yeah. Other questions. Let's. We'll get to an opportunity for public testimony. Is there other questions for the uh, for the presenter or the staff? On demolition, or are we going on? Uh, we can go on either part. Yeah, I, I think it's important. You know, uh, um, just for a little color on that, uh, uh, we had a question that was circulated among the commissioners regarding whether the the petition would be. Um, considered in two parts or in one part demolition and then new resident or all at once and it does it becomes a little unwieldy to do it all at once but we prefer it I prefer it to be all at once because I don't ever want to give a demolition permit without understanding what the replacement structure is so it's important that we talk about both aspects of it so uh, if you have questions on the new house I'd like to hear those now to give the well I have a question on the landscaping okay that's fine um, just about the two trees in the front uh, you're proposing to move, remove one of them or keep one of them or which one were you keeping? Because I know the arborist, the city arborist, had a concern about the, Just the large the large, the large one sitting down on the right hand side, the upper row. Please step to the podium. That's one you're keeping? That's one you're keeping, yes. Okay. 
Thanks. It's hard for the folks at home that are following along to uh, get the comments from the back of the That's room. That's the same one that the arborist had a concern about? No, I think he was talking, there's a weeping beech that uh, you can barely see on the left-hand side, um, which, you know, I mean, I, I guess anything's possible to move a tree uh, of that size. Move it, oh wow. To try to, to but it's not, um, you know, I mean, I think, I think it's an interesting tree, a weeping, it's a sort of an arboretum type of tree, but it, it isn't, I mean, un, you know, so we're trying to save the, the big granddaddy tree and, 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 and that type of thing. So I, I mean, the problem with the weeping beech is it's a very polarizing, it's like a, if people know a yucca plant, like, oh, I hate yuccas, and, and some people love them. So it's a polarizing kind of plant. So it makes people, some people make feel, feel, feel very sad. And, and, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and while I would like it, my clients uh, aren't, aren't fond of it. And, and, uh, and so we were, we were, we were and it, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to replace, uh, bring in new trees. Like the, a lot of these trees are, are not native at all. And I think one of the, one of the ideas we really want to do is, is even though we're a little more formal in the front, I think we do want to start to dot the landscape throughout the site with, with native trees. Uh, the oaks and, and, and some of those types of things that, that will be around uh, two, three generations from now. And some of these trees are not that, mm -hmm. that type of tree, you know. Um, and so that's, that's really what, you know, we're going to be replacing caliper inches per city code, and we're probably going to exceed it, as we typically do with our jobs. So, um, you know, there's, it's just one of those trees that with the construction, it's going to, you know, we'd have to move the whole house for it. Yeah, that we just he, didn't, and they don't love it, so it's kind of hard to sell. Yeah, I think he was worried about losing that canopy because I remember driving by here in the summer; it did have such a beautiful canopy there. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always pains you to, to 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 lose a big tree. I mean, you know, I, I don't like to chop down trees, so but, but we try to be really careful with the ones that we do save, and then our our, our construction specifications on how they're safeguarded. It's not just with some cheap plastic fence that falls down, and in a couple of weeks we put up, you know, chain link that they can't to keep the root zone safe. Um, so you're okay with, um, I think the arborist had suggested you put more trees into your plan. Yes, we, we, we agree with that. I mean, we, we again, we're, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a tree nut and I, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I love open lands and I love the, the whole idea behind keeping Lake Forest uh, uh, not a sanitized looking landscape. Uh, I, I want it to be filled with native deciduous, you know, not, not a lot of blue spruce. I mean, I think it needs to be more of the native things, the reason people came here to begin with. So that's what our intent is, um, really. Okay, okay. Great. thank you. Thank you. Are, are, are these your materials right here? Uh, floor? Yes, they are. I mean, there's some, there's some of the uh, slate from the roof there from Austin. Okay, um, what else is here? Well, the, the, uh, the field stone, um, it's just a small piece of it, but it's a, it's not a vernacular stone. It comes from out east, but it, it's nice about it is it, it ages, ages very quickly. I've used it quite a few times on projects in now, Michigan. You, I think the report said that there's going to be some low walls in the... Yeah, there's, and there's some low walls on the house that's there. They're using a Wisconsin limestone. Uh, but as for the proposed... Uh, well, it, it would be of more of the... Uh, the small shard of rock, which is a, a Pennsylvania fieldstone, random, uh, random mix, uh, uh, you know, with the mortar joints uh, mortar back deeply, and then uh, bluestone uh, that we feel picks up the the uh, horizontal surface of the slate, and possibly on the pool deck, you know, based on budgeting and, and cost valuation and analysis, we could end up using a uh, a local pea gravel. Uh, in an exposed aggregate context for for some of the drive surfaces, and maybe possibly pool deck, you know. So um, it's really, so, and then maybe a, an antique reclaimed paver uh, in some spots uh, that would come from Chicago streets, uh, you know. So which you know, it's nice when you can use local materials as much as possible on these homes because. And, and where would where would the pavers go? Are you mixed in? Uh, if we go to the, if I can get you to the. Might use it to. Um, am I going the wrong way, Austin? Uh, 
There you go. Sort of in this foreground, just okay. as, as an apron. As here. an apron. And then we would maybe do some banding on the driveway here. Again, just to get some uh, texture, mm -hmm. rougher texture in the foreground of the house to make it even recede further back, just using sort of an artistic, you know, artistic sort of trick that coarser textures in the foreground uh, make something uh, recede more. So it's just a, sort of a trick Where, for perspective. Where does that red brick go? Pardon? Where does that red brick go? That's it's this. You mean to walk through? No. Well, is that the one that's? No, I mean it's going to be. I want. It's one we had in the office. It, it would be a, an old hand thrown okay, brick. Okay. Wouldn't necessarily be that. No, that's too red for me. I want yeah. something a little bit more uh, Merlot uh, okay. bottle color, <laughs> with with a little variation in color, so it doesn't look. It could even go to more of a gray, quite honestly. I mean, but. We're 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 uh, we're not really into the design development that deeply, but this is sort of a, a look that we're trying to achieve. Uh, re real materials as much as possible, um, you know, no fake brick or no, nothing like that. Other questions? Austin has the uh, selection of the stone for the home. Also, is that a, a something that's getting fine-tuned, or is that the, are we seeing kind of the color palette that we would expect to see? Yeah, exactly. This uh, this rendering here really uh, tries to give an accurate uh, depiction of that stone. And really, looking at this Pen uh, Pennsylvania flagstone, it's kind of a mix of blues, grays, and a little bit of gold. Um, so we're going to work with Herr Schout. We really want the stone for the project to extend into the landscape and make it feel like it was all taken from, from one quarry and built at one time. And just touch real fast for us on the lighting. There's a, uh, I'm sure you saw the staff report, or maybe you didn't see. Do you see the staff report? Oh, yeah, for the concerns about the yeah. lighting at the Could front entry. Can you talk entry. about that for us a little bit? Yeah, maybe I'll have uh, Doug speak to just landscape lighting in general because there's certainly going to be a sensitive sensitivity to it but I think the idea was we wanted to come before the commission tonight make sure uh, the layout is okay and then the next stage of design development would be getting into lighting okay it's gonna pull the landscape plan lighting plan up Oh, right here? Yeah, it's in here. Like here. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Page four of the uh, landscape mm -hmm. plan. Okay, it's a little tough to read, isn't it? I mean, you guys... We it, have it here, so if you walk us through, we can try to follow along. Okay. Um, well, as, as you can see, the, the red are the, are the proposed lights. Um, there, it looks like we're, we're softly... Uh, it's been a while since I looked at this, so excuse me. I'm trying to jump from concept into something that is... Is up up light uh, one up light on each tree coming in? Yeah, I am, and and then one up light on this large tree that we're saving, and there are some coach lights on the house. Uh, there's an overhead light underneath the the front entrance way. There's a under a down lights out, out of the uh, porch, uh, the covered porch on the back. And then the rest of these, um, there is an uplight on small tree. Well, we're going to put in some large trees, two really large shade trees on the very back, because we want those trees coming up over the house again. 
Um, so this, and then the rest of this is wayfinding path lights. Um, we are not lighting anything uh, in terms of night, I, I, the night sky, we'd like to keep this all night sky back here. So uh, once you get again off this plinth, and I sort of always say it, it, it's like the old homes in England that were done in the Italianate and French style, uh, and then Capability Brown came along and s swept it off. That anything, the, the rationale is anything that was on a podium, they kind of kept. But once you stepped down and went over the haha, it was all about native. English landscape, and that's what that's the concept here. Is that this is all very, all natural. So this is mostly what we have here is wayfinding, uh, lighting. It's not to be theatrical or downlighting or anything like that. Sure. While you have this drawing up, if you could, um, I'll challenge you again since you're so handy at getting that file up. If you could zoom up to the northeast corner of that uh, plan, and show us the sidewalk connection. Um, the path, yeah. Let's just talk about that for a minute. Yeah. All right, let's see that. There you go. Perfect. Is that close enough for you? Yeah, if you can do one more, I'll take one more. Beautiful. Oh. There so this, um, I actually not sure I could see this. I'm not sure if it was covered with snow or, <laughs> or if I just failed to look. Is the so this is is this the continuation of the sidewalk that comes down, the street along the south side of the street that then. Is there a sidewalk on this street? I don't know. That's what I'm at. There's no. There's no. So, so no. this just goes to the street and. But what this what this is is. Um, I wanted them to get rid of the, the U-shaped driveway with two curb cuts, essentially. And I wanted one central way into the property, uh, just avoid confusion and to, to keep the... So what this was, they said, well, how do we get our garbage and things out to the street? Do we have to bring it all the way out? And, and you know, we're not going to be snow melting, and do we have to plow? So this was really a sneak through, is really all it is mm -hmm. um, at this stage. And so it, you know, it could just... Probably, is it a is it a sidewalk or a driveway? It's a it's a sidewalk. Sidewalk. Okay. Yeah, it, it's just enough to to take garbage cans out okay. to the street. All right. That's really all it is. No, it's not. It isn't enough. You could. No. A, a, it's it's only about five or six foot wide. Okay. Just yeah. curious. Yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Other questions? Well, the staff had the report had some kind of concern about the uplighting of the street. Given the natural character of, of this area, um, commission input on the use of uplighting in the front yard and um, illuminating that formal row of trees is, is requested. Um, I think with the addition of some additional trees in the front, um, there may be less concern um, for highlighting that, that feature, um, but certainly your discussion and, and input is requested. <coughs> Could I ask a question of the uh, landscape uh, architect? Uh, relative to these uh, up lights on the trees, mm -hmm. uh, are those trees uh, going to lose their leaves during the winter time? And will the light continue to shine up then into the sky through their branches? Or what do you, you think? Well, they're pretty low voltage, I, you know, what we're, what we're trying to do. Yes, I mean, they are deciduous trees, so they're going to lose their, their leaves. That's right. But, uh, <laughs> you won't get any night sky pollution out of these. I mean, I guess you could say light goes on forever, but I, sure. I don't think you're going to see like a halo effect or anything. I mean, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty dark back there. I mean, it's, it's not street lights and things. Good way to keep it, right? It's, no, it's great. So not, and I don't think we've overlit it. You know, we're not, we're not trying to, sh um, you know, I mean, it, that's a really subjective thing as well. I mean, some people really want, want to, to know where their front entrance is uh, since we've narrowed it down to one driveway. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, I, you know, it, to, to me, if that, you know, if you want to make, make passing of, of the whole bill uh, uh, contingent on further review of lighting, I'm quite pleased with that. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did you, oh, I'm not making it All right, so. I mean, you know, I, I did the landscape around this place, you know, and then on the corner down here, Deer Path, and, and, and we didn't overlight that or this, so. 
All right, now's an opportunity for the public, if they have any comments, to come on up and tell us what they're thinking. Uh, do we have any public comments? Come on up and introduce yourself for the folks at home and tell us what you think. My name is Dennis Nyron. I live at 283 West Laurel Avenue, and I just wanted to testify about the quality of the construction of the house. Um, I've lived there 15 years. I was. Uh, uh, Andy Brown was a good, is a good friend of mine. Uh, Ralph, his father, was a good friend of mine. I spent a lot of time in that house talking to Ralph about what we're going to do next uh, on his landscape. And uh, as a concerned neighbor and a director of Lake Forest Open Lands uh, and a trustee at Lake Forest College, where I planted 200 oak trees uh, starting in 1994, uh, if you drive down um, uh, Sheridan Road in front of the college, all those trees were little when I put them in, and now they're huge, and it's one of the best vistas in all of uh, our community. And I worked thousands of hours working uh, for open lands at the, uh, uh, the, the West Skokie Nature Preserve where I built a house, and I had some exterior lighting. Uh, uh, and also, um, I bought this house and totally renovated it. It was a um, uh, historic house. It's a designated house, 1928 construction, uh, and uh, the uh, the architect. We did a book on him, uh, and uh, it, it worked out very nicely. So. Um, I've been in that house many times. It's very um, mediocre construction. Thin walls, not much insulation. Windows are substandard. Uh, the, the Browns always knew the house was going to get ripped when they were gone, and they both passed away in the same year a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So I want to just uh, share that with you. Plus. It has a separate uh, garage. It's not attached. There's really they didn't do anything to, to maintain it, and uh, except you know if there was leaking roofs, etc. Uh, with regard to the lighting, I had lighting at my house that I built in 1989 over on Broadsmoor, and uh, the problem is lighting's okay if you need it for entertainment or something like that. This is a very dark street, and we don't want street lights. We do not want sidewalks. We live in the open lands. We're surrounded by the golf course, uh, the Hafner Meadow, where I spent thousands of hours restoring the native uh, flora, uh, and uh, Shaw Prairie. So uh, if they want to put those lights up, that's great, but it would be nice if they didn't put it on every night so that we would be blasted, uh, you know, with unnatural lighting. So if it was a special event and they wanted to do that, that's fine. There are, we drive down the street sometimes and one of the houses here, which is on the National Historic Register, you know, their lights are really bright and, it, and it's uh, disconcerting to some of us. So those are the only comments that I had at this time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming out on a cold night. Any other public uh, comments? No other public comment. Uh, so now's an opportunity for the commissioners to uh, deliberate. I'll go first. Go. Um, you know, I'm, I'm okay with the demo. I think uh, we've sufficiently, you know, vetted this at this point. We've seen Austin twice. Um, he's obviously done a lot of research on this. On, and, you know, the house obviously doesn't even look like a Ralph Huzzack house. I mean, it's it's probably done by a staff person. I know he's, he's a significant architect based on his body of work and, you know, and I know this is weird to hear me say this, but I don't think this is a significant <laughs> home. The other flip side of it is I think the um, replacement design to me fits the site so much better. And it's such, I think it's a great design. I think it's beautiful. Um, and I know that sounds subjective, but I think it's a very traditional, um, well done house that fits the site better 
and um, you've obviously made it very compatible with the neighborhood, and so that to me is more convincing of a demo. Um, it's not a good quality house. It's not good of his. It's not good representation of his work. And the flip side, much better designed house for the lot. Um, and I think the landscape plan, we might need to consider putting a little bit more screening in there, more mature trees. It seems like that's your intent all along, which is great with the native trees. The lighting, I think, uh, you know, maybe some reduction of the up lighting just to keep that dark sky. You do need some kind of driveway marker. I mean, it is a dark street, but maybe be a little bit more sensitive and reduce more of the up lighting. Um, so that's in a nutshell. Sorry, it's kind of off the cuff there, but. Sorry, right. thank you. Yeah. John? Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, you looked like you were ready. Well, I just prepared, <laughs> I prepared some comments. <laughs> uh, well, uh, my, my, my comment really is that, uh, uh, that uh, not having been provided with the Historic Preservation Consultant's Report and Assessment, a written report, as I'm used to, or the structural evaluation from an independent structural engineer, as I'm used to in these demolition uh, applications, uh, as provided for in the ordinance, I feel a certain degree of discomfort as to uh, my the basis on which I could make a decision at this time on uh, this petition. And so it would be my strong preference uh, if possible to uh, continue the matter with all the other good comments which have been made and uh, to ask uh, the petitioner uh, to reduce to writing all of the good research that they've done with uh, respect to uh, the historical aspects of the site. And uh, it seems based on what staff has to say that uh, the structural aspects are not uh, from their viewpoint and what the chairman had to say, not paramount. So it doesn't seem like that would uh, actually be of uh, importance. And then the only other thing I have to say, of course, is uh, uh, I agree with, uh, with uh, other folks who have spoken about uh, the uh, op lights and uh, uh, doing what can be done to uh, preserve uh, dark skies. So I'll jump in. I, I, I usually wait till everybody else is, but I can't stand it. I gotta jump <laughs> You're the chairman. The, uh, I, I actually love uh, Austin's description of the house being the architectural or non-architectural or historic nature of the home being self-evident. I agree mm -hmm. completely. I don't think, I don't need anybody to explain it to me, oh, but I'm an architect. Yes. <laughs> Uh, it's as delicate as I could put it. <laughs> so I'm completely fine. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time, and we will more this evening, um, talking about the character preservation aspect of what the, our charter is for, you know, what we're really here to do. And um, we have to remind ourselves sometimes, um, you know, that it's about the character like Forest and what are we trying to encourage folks to do here? Um, what do we, you know, what, what, what's the nature of the environment that we're, pers you know, that we are preserving? And I'm not talking about the trees in this statement. Um, so uh, I love the house. I think it's a great uh, uh, addition to the neighborhood. I love that you've been working with neighbors, talking to them, and uh, that their only uh, concerns are technical in nature. You know, the lighting, I think, is a legitimate concern, and I think the staff did a good job identifying both the landscaping and the lighting as items that probably need a little more polish. I think that the conditions that they, um, uh, you know, suggested are good conditions then both, you know, that address both those issues. Um, and this is, I would be happy to have this house built next door to my house. That's always a good test for, you know, for a house. So uh, I, I think it's a great project and, uh, you know, um, probably, uh, we could grade the landscape a little more severely in terms of what actually is going to be um, built, but it seems like it's in very good hands, and so I'm less inclined to do that. I, I would probably encourage the staff to look at that closely, but I, I like the design intent of the landscape, and so you know, having this uh, a little more formal nature in the front of the home, but then trailing off and blending and mixing with the existing landscaping, both at the neighbors and both at the open lands to the rear, that's all from a design point of view, that works fine for me. So I'm very much in support of the petition. I think it's a be a great addition to the neighborhood. So. Yeah, I concur with you and Susan. I think it's um, it's a it's a really really nice thoughtful design, and I'm in support of of um, 
of the new project as well as you know saying goodbye to um, a pleasant home but I think this is a, going to be a great addition to the neighborhood so I'm, I'm supportive of it as well all right run. I'm not good to go yeah I'm good to go <laughs> yeah I'm comfortable with the demolition uh, and the new house I would but entertain a motion at this time if there's any such thing I'd move to grant a certificate of appropriateness for the proposed demolition and overall site plan, landscape plan, and design of the replacement structure uh, based on findings in the staff report and subject to the conditions therein. All right, the motion's been made by Commissioner Ransom. Is there a second? It's a seconded by Commissioner Preschlack. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. <laughs> One opposed. Congratulations, good luck with it. It looks like a big project to keep you out of trouble for a little while. <laughs> All right. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Great research. Thank you. I will ask if anyone needs to take a quick break. Are you, you okay? You, you need a break? Yeah. All right, if the next petitioner has any setup to do, come on and set up and uh, we'll give it two minutes or four minutes and uh, yeah, we'll one. go from there. <clears throat> Thanks. Maybe my last word of here. Sit forward, and you've got to smile, making the occasional eye contact with them. All right, our next petition here is a commercial petition. It's the introduction of various modifications proposed at the train station at 700 McKinley Road to accommodate a new tenant, Dunkin' Donuts, in a space that was previously occupied by the Northern Trust Bank. A drive through facility is proposed. The proposed work includes modifications to the existing window, the addition of a trash enclosure, a landscape plan with a new median railing and an overall signage plan. Uh, we're taking no action tonight on this agenda item. This is uh, being presented for information and discussion. Um, and uh, so we look forward to uh, talking about it. I'm, I would ask if anyone has any ex parte conflict. I'm not sure it's possible. <laughs> I bought Dunkin' Donuts. You guys donuts are franchisees for Dunkin' Donuts. So, um, or own the railroad. So with that, I'll, get, I'll let you start. <laughs> Thanks. Please introduce yourself. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mario Valentini. I'm with Warren Jansen Architects. 
We're here on behalf of uh, Lake Forest Donuts, as the, obviously the uh, ownership company of uh, the Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, they're the franchisee for this location. Uh, very quickly, the, there's many locations that they own throughout the Chicagoland area, up in exceeding uh, 40 to 45. So the uh, operation of this location um, will won't be a you know, first-time user. Uh, the other, uh, obviously, difference of, in this location is that it's, it, it won't be anything typical of un, uh, locations uh, that they own, uh, but the operations uh, primarily stay the same. Um, you know, we, we are understanding uh, the, the significance of uh, the, the historic the history of this building, um, but in this case, uh, the, the, the previous tenant wasn't the same use, uh, although they had a drive-through, uh, a business use like a bank is going to be slightly different than uh, the use that's here. So with that, with the use of that uh, drive-through, there are components of which we need to incorporate to have this function that weren't there uh, as a part of the bank. Although the bank's uh, use is all long gone now, now that the, the, the station had been um, and gone under some of renovations itself already. The, uh, the little uh, tenant space uh, hadn't gone through any portion of that renovation except for the window, the restoration of the window, um, which was done, I believe, last year. The uh, understanding uh, that we had as a part of the um, lease offering for this space was that the use of that previous, um, uh, the, the old uh, bank system where there was a canopy and whatnot wasn't going to be there. So we knew uh, going into this uh, kind of proposal that we would have to modify this building, um, obviously trying to do that as little as possible, but trying to incorporate, like I said, elements that are needed for the function of this location and the drive through um, right now, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, change that has happened to the east side of that building with the removal of the bank components. Also with what is going to be proposed uh, in the future with bike paths uh, and so on and so forth. So some of the bus route uh, traffic has, has gone. Um, but what we've done is we've tried to put together something that um, not only functions for the need of our client, but also uh, is as you know, not as impactful as uh, you know a, a typical Dunkin' Donuts would be in a building. Um, but also, you know, obviously, what customers are used to seeing, um, what uh, is is you know basically a national brand, and what they would like to see, and what they need to kind of have to know that it's going to operate uh, smoothly. Uh, in addition to that, with, uh, you know, some of the plans that we've got, uh, you know, they're not all finalized yet. We're still going through uh, the zoning process. We're still trying to hone in on some finalized um, drawings that we're working through with the bike path. Uh, we've tried to strategically put things uh, in place that not only function for everyone's needs, the needs of the station, uh, for parking, the needs of the tenant for the drive-through use, the, the use of the new uh, bike path, and those commuters that they may be using that uh, as their means and methods of getting to the train station. And, uh, you know, we want to support that. We want to work with it and obviously keep it safe. So we'll talk tonight about a couple things that uh, are trying to do that uh, while, you know, still having this drive-through uh, lane function. So uh, having said that, um, what I'll do is start with, uh, here's our site, right? So um, <clears throat> everybody is uh, well aware of, you know, we're in the northeast corner of the existing building. Um, right now, as I was mentioning, there's, uh, there's a little bit of um, unstructured uh, traffic patterns going on here. I think once 
uh, you know, things are put in place uh, and, and our proposal will help uh, kind of identify those, um, you know, lanes of traffic and, and, and obviously trying to keep it safe. Uh, station uh, as it exists now, we've got the uh, east elevations. We also are showing the um, entrance to the space that is on the west side of the building. Um, significant, uh, as we'll talk about signage. Um, the north elevation, um, there's a canopy there right now that is the current kind of bike storage area protecting the bikes. Uh, the understanding is that will be removed eventually as the bike path is incorporated and the storage for bikes go um, away from that general area. Um, you'll see there's the, the landscaping, the current landscaping um, on the north face of the building, <clears throat> very dated, um, basically just uh, maintained and uh, um, but kind of overgrown. Well, uh, one more uh, quick item is that um, the upper left hand picture is going to depict what's there now with um, I, I believe at one point there was a tenant in the uh, southern, I'm sorry, southern, yeah, southern area of the station. And um, so there's also a uh, doorway, walkway that we need to maintain uh, for still that use. So, you know, part of our site plan incorporates still trying to keep that functional. And, and again, uh, not having another crossing path uh, through the drive through lane. Uh, so very quick, just a uh, you know look at what uh, the improvements are. Um, the one uh, obstacle we had was that the um, the the grading as we go from uh, McKinley to the entrance of the station, uh, you know, needs to be adjusted. We used the um, island. Uh, separating the drive-through lane is not only uh, obviously a physical barrier, but there's stairs or steps up um, to obviously uh, you know make that grade change uh, a little easier. Um, having said that, the landscaping here is just kind of shown uh, where we're trying to use uh, species of uh, plants that we know it, it can kind of um, exist uh, with traffic, salt, uh, you know, uh, things like that. Uh, winter, uh, obviously right now we would be uh, concerned about that. A lot of salt going down and, you know, the, the, the soil and uh, whatnot and, and how that uh, get, is affected by uh, the, and the plants and how they may be affected in the spring by some heavy salting, whatnot. Um, there's, again, a couple key elements. We're trying to maintain the uh, facade of the building as much as possible. There's signage um, kind of right at the uh, corner of our space. Uh, the one uh, lower uh, portion of the uh, center piece of the window is going to be removed. Uh, it's the operating uh, uh, piece right now, and we're eventually going to make it the uh, biparting piece needed for drive-through. Um, do we have details of that uh, in the next piece? <coughs> Again, uh, a look uh, kind of a little uh, differently. Um, you'll, you'll see a little bit more of the signage uh, that we need for um, basically just traffic patterns and uh, you know, trying to keep things uh, as, as safe as possible. We've, we've keyed uh, a lot of the foot traffic, pedestrian traffic, to one path of travel. Uh, right now it's just kind of um, all over and the, the use of the median uh, through the lane to separate the traffic patterns also gives us the ability to just kind of focus that uh, pedestrian travel and, and path to the station or away from the station. Uh, in one kind of uh, you know, specific area, a for, for well for two reasons. The uh, it's 
it's a break in the uh, car paths to the window, uh, but also uh, we use the species of plants to kind of create a um, little bit of a, uh, an understanding that, you know, we, we don't want people obviously walking through the landscaping for a couple reasons. The, the, the pitch is not uh, good, obviously it's, it's going to have a little bit of a steep slope to it and uh, we also want to get them to the open areas as opposed to walking through the landscaping. I'm, I'm assuming that beeping went off because I need to kind of move things forward. So uh, having said that, um, the, the drawings, uh, we have the proposed site plan and the drive-through equipment. When I say equipment, I mean things like, uh, you know, a, a, a bar that will tell you, you know, this is a clearance bar. If you're, if you're hitting this bar, uh, you may, uh, you know, have a problem getting your vehicle through. Um, we've got uh, protected bollards that will help. Um, obviously, there's uh, cars traveling close to the building, and uh, we want to be able to protect uh, not only the, uh, the, you know, the cars from hitting the building, but obviously as a, as a physical barrier to keep them uh, a little bit away from the, the building itself. Menu boards and uh, the ornamental fence um, are under the uh, porch area of the um, of the station. The, the the ornamental fence is is needed as the, the direct path uh, is is not protected. So we, we we feel comfortable knowing that when this fence is there, people have to actually physically pay attention to uh, the path of travel. Um, a lot of people on a cell phone walking out of the station, you know, it's too, uh, it's not very focused. And so uh, putting that fence up will help uh, focus the pedestrians in a certain direction. Um, this is a, uh, just a coloration of what the menu board would look like. I believe there's a, um, a picture of one that was given to you from the Lake Forest uh, Preservation Foundation. Um, it's not necessarily a accurate version of what we're uh, intending, but you can see from here, uh, obviously there's gonna be menu offerings that we need to advertise, and uh, those are posted on there. Oh, in addition to the fact that um, there needs to be some amount of communication, so you've got uh, integrated speaker and uh, uh, integrated uh, microphone. Um, this is a, a slide of the uh, proposed fence. Um, we, we, we tried to uh, find uh, a local uh, business that may have used a fence like this. Uh, we did. Uh, the Market Square restaurant uh, uses this fence in the Central Business District. Uh, so we, tried, we actually found uh, something that might be appropriately uh, similar to the neighbors. Um, again, uh, very quickly, just a, a, a site signage map uh, indicating um, what signage is, what the signage is, where it's going. Um, we've created this uh, mock-up. Uh, we tried to kind of get you to understand the uh, scale, um, color, uh, texture. Uh, the, uh, the proposed sign is obviously made of wood. And uh, the letters would be uh, uh, carved out. Uh, actually, it's in reverse. So uh, this is a, uh, a plan showing again the species of landscaping, the trash enclosure, um, and kind of the intent of uh, the fabrication of of that and the uh, the different locations of the species of plants. Uh, so again, quick uh, understanding of the different species. Again, very uh, kind of moderate in scale, uh, enough to where people can understand they shouldn't be uh, walking through it, but also uh, low enough so that people can be seen as they're walking through the path of travel by the cars. Uh, very quickly, uh, kind of a drawing about uh, the elevation of the building, um, tr again, trying to keep the items uh, to a minimum, uh, the impact of the building. 
Uh, very quickly, the uh, location of the proposed drive-through window. Um, so the it is highlighted in red, but it's not a red frame, just so everyone's aware of that. We're using uh, the color of the frame to match uh, what's existing. It'll be an aluminum frame as opposed to the wood frame. Simple reason is uh, it'll, it'll, it'll withstand the uh, constant opening and closing. Uh, if it's a wood framed window, it just, uh, it'll, never, it'll never last. Um, again, uh, pictures of the and coloration of the of the signage. Some of these slides will talk about the interior of the space, uh, which is still under a little bit of design development. But we can uh, we can go through that if um, the commission has questions on that. I think Do you other have a rendering than that, of what it'll look like inside. What's that? Do you have a rendering of what it'll look like inside? We haven't developed that yet. Oh, okay. The the actually the intent is uh, to try and maintain uh, as many of the current finishes as there are. Um, you know the 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 wood uh, is uh, you know, something we can we can definitely work with. So the the detailing around the windows, the ceilings, uh, you know they can all be maintained. I mean we can. Actually, what we're trying to do is use the um, existing uh, transaction wall with a, a you know slight modification so that it can be used as the transaction area uh, for the Dunkin' Donuts. Um, having said that, I'm I'm available for uh, questions. Um, the petitioner, uh, the actually the franchisee, uh, is also here uh, just to kind of talk about. Uh, elements of the brand if, if need be. Okay, great. Do we have a staff report? Thanks. Yes, thank you, Chairman Peretz. Um, a bit of background. A number of years ago, the city approached Union Pacific, um, a, a, a fair number of years ago now, um, and uh, entered into an agreement to take responsibility for the terminal. Um, in other locations, Union Pacific had um, taken the steps of actually um, demolishing existing terminals and constructing something new and, and frankly easier to maintain. So the city recognized the importance of the train station to the community. And we have uh, in recent years been able to uh, gain some grants that have allowed us to do some repairs. The Historic Preservation Commission has seen some of the, the projects over the last couple years. Um, the roof was reconstructed, I believe, about 18 months ago. Uh, some of the original dormers were restored. Uh, what we haven't done yet is uh, some of the tuck pointing uh, and some of the painting of the woodwork, which is badly needed, which is planned for this spring and summer. Um, knowing that it takes money to maintain the station, uh, the City Council really has pressed to find tenants to occupy the train station. Uh, Pasquese's Garden Shop went in on the west side of the railroad tracks, really has been very well received, has brought color and vitality to that space um, and activity to that area. Um, over a, a year ago, we did go out with an RFP looking for tenants to occupy the space at the north end of the building on the east side of the railroad tracks that was previ previously <coughs> occupied by Northern Trust Bank. Um, Northern Trust Bank, as was mentioned, uh, at one point had a drive-through window, which was to the north of the existing windows on the east elevation. Later, they put up a canopy, um, and I, I think many of us were very pleased when we were able to have that canopy removed because that really opened up that building. Uh, so as the Property and Public Lands Committee of the City Council looked at prospective tenants, Dunkin' Donuts came forward with a proposal. Um, and the planning and the PPL, uh, the committee really looked at this carefully. And I think the committee really understands that it's, it's a tricky balance, uh, recognizing the prominence of the train station, the importance of the historic character of the train station, but they did direct staff to move this forward, to work with the petitioner, uh, and really to see if we could achieve a, a balance, uh, to put a use in that space that would meet the needs of com commuters, uh, certainly bring in some sales tax revenue, 
and yet still be something that could uh, maintain the integrity of that site. So um, it, it hasn't been an easy project. We've really batted this around for many, many months. Earlier this month, this project was seen by the Plan Commission. Because this is a drive-through, essentially a fast food restaurant with a drive-through, it does require a special use permit. And there are specific criteria in the code that the Plan Commission is charged with looking at for drive-throughs. And those have to do with safety, they have to do with congestion, they have to do with points of conflict. So the Plan Commission um, heard some public testimony, heard a presentation from the petitioner, and continued the matter with direction to staff to go back and, and look at the drive-through queuing uh, to see if there was a way we could refine that, that queue area, queuing area and the circulation in the parking lot that is to the south of the drive-through. We're working on that with the petitioners and with engineering staff and with our police department. They also directed that we look more carefully at the pedestrian crossing uh, that was alluded to on the east side of the building. The buses now load um, on Westminster and so uh, when they pull up at the end of the day, we've, we've sat there and watched and, and the number of people walking across that, the area that would be that pedestrian crossing and into that building, it, it's a fair number of people. So those are the pieces of this project that the Plan Commission is working on. Again, they've, they've continued the matter. They will see this again in April at their next meeting. In the meantime, we will continue to work on that. Um, in the <coughs> staff report, we've tried to lay out the items that are under the purview of the Historic Preservation Commission, and very briefly, I just want to talk through those. Um, the first is the drive-through window. Um, this, is, this solution is not the first solution that was presented or the first option that was presented. We do believe that this solution for the drive-through window, taking the window just by itself, does, the least, uh, does have the least amount of impact on that east elevation. Um, we didn't want to see a new window put in again to the north of those windows. Uh, as I mentioned, there was one there years ago and, and it was bricked up. Um, and in some of those photos, you can actually see the remnants that was repaired in the last couple years. So we didn't want to see that wall reopened again. Um, the second aspect is um, the railing that would be installed just opposite the the entrance door or the exit door from the train station, that railing would be about eight feet long. And as was explained, it would be black and would be similar to what is located in Market House. Um, fairly unobtrusive. It is critical to assuring that pedestrians have time after they come out of that building uh, to, to turn, to the, uh, turn to their left and notice the traffic before they step into that path. Um, the third aspect is the landscaping in the median. Uh, I think that that landscaping really needs to achieve two things. It, it needs to be solid enough so that pedestrians don't cross through at all different points at that median. Uh, as was noted, there will be a grade change there because at the highest point, uh, the grade will be increased about 18 inches to bring cars up high enough so you can reach the window. Um, so it will be important for that landscaping to be thick enough to uh, discourage people from walking through. And, and although it needs to be low enough to allow pedestrians to be visible, it also seems to be important to have it be high enough to screen some of the cars in that drive-through lane and perhaps provide some softening uh, to the railing that would be installed and to the menu board and some other signage that would be in that location. So we would want to work uh, closely with the petitioner to really enhance and refine the landscaping proposed in that median. The fourth aspect is the trash enclosure. Uh, currently, the businesses located in the train station don't generate much trash, so there, there is no trash enclosure there. We did look, working with our public works department at different locations for a trash enclosure, um, and frankly, there, there is no great location at that site. Um, you do have a letter from the Preservation Foundation suggesting that if, in fact, a trash enclosure is needed in that area, that perhaps consideration be given to um, a brick wall, perhaps something along the lines of, of what is behind City Hall, something that, that would be more sympathetic to that building, particularly since it will be highly visible <coughs> from that north end. Certainly some landscape screening can be um, 
added back, there will, but there will be a limited amount of landscape screening that can be added. The north front of that will need to open so dumpsters can be rolled out. Um, the fifth aspect is the signage. Um, and as was mentioned, there are very as various aspects to the signage, everything from a menu board to identification signs on the building um, at Westminster and Deer Path, and then various directional signs that direct cars, vehicles into the drive-through lane, caution pedestrians, um, and then there would also need to be a clearance bar. Uh, certainly consistent with the work of this commission, we would want to work to minimize the signage to the extent possible. Uh, we do know that there, uh, certainly this sign presented tonight uh, comes a, a long way from the signage that was initially presented to us, so there certainly has been work done on that. Um, as we look at any signage that would be on Westminster or Deer Path, from the staff perspective, we would suggest um, some kind of coordinated signage plan that, that perhaps the, the city takes responsibility for that, that would identify the commuter parking. There's a sign out there right now that does that. Perhaps some reworking of that could allow us to identify various activities in the train station. Um, this is before you tonight for direction, for input. Um, again, we know it is, uh, it's a very unusual request. It is uh, one that that is really a tough balance, but if in fact the city council is going to move in the direction of um, signing a lease with this tenant, we wanna try and be a, as prepared as possible to allow this use to fit in to the best extent that we can. So looking for your comments and direction tonight. All right, now is an opportunity for commissioners to ask questions of either the staff or the petitioner. Yeah, some Jim. questions for Kathy. Um, can, can you just go over who's making the decisions here in terms of the various commissions and boards and the city council? And if this is a done deal and it's already been decided at the city and we're just trying to you know, kind of, kind of suboptimize this versus us really having a hand at saying this is not something that's in keeping with the character of this town because this, this really reminds me of, of the Barrett College petition that, that came before us. I know we have a narrow purview, but our ordinance is to maintain the integrity of the, of the city. And I, I, frankly, I can't think of any project that would violate that more than this one. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm really just kind of, it sounds like it's a done deal. And if it is, then we're just kind of operating ar around the margins. And, you know, I know the city council will be watching this. And I'll just say, you know, as a historic preservation person and trying to follow my purview, it, it doesn't make you feel good that, that, that it's handed this way to us when it's just in clear conflict with what we're trying to do in terms of preserving the integrity of the structure and the character of the town. So I just like to hear I your comments. I can tell you that it is not a done deal. A lease is not signed with Dunkin' Donuts. A term sheet has been entered into. Um, the plan commission has not signed off on this, but you're correct in that your purview, your, your, um, the aspects of this project over which the commission has a voice are limited. And, and I believe that the city council will take the recommendation of both the historic preservation commission and the plan commission into account in making a final decision. Um, it, it, it may, Certainly we've had the discussion that if there wasn't a drive-through, that this use probably would is workable. Um, there previously was a, uh, a coffee shop in there. Uh, certainly we could find a way to make the signage work, at least in staff's opinion. Um, but we do understand that the drive-through is essential to this use. So no, it's not a done deal. I think that um, the more input and the more specific areas that you can identify that, um, go directly to that character issue, go directly to your criteria, I, I think the, the better that can help to inform the decision of the city council. Can I, can I ask Kathy a question, uh, sure. Chairman? You know, Kathy, I, I, I have to say, just reacting not so much to uh, the presentation, a very nice presentation by Duncan Nonitz, which I appreciate, but your presentation, I, I, I have to say that my reading of the ordinance, for what it matters, probably nothing, is entirely out of sync with what you told us. You told us essentially what, you know, our purview is limited. 
Oh, yeah. You told us that our purview is limited to, uh, you know, talking about the drive through windows, the railing, the landscapes, the, tr the nature of the trash enclosure, brick versus wood, and signage. But when I look at the, uh, the purpose of the historic preservation ordinance, it tells us that uh, our purpose is uh, much broader than that. We're to promote the educational, cultural, economic, and general welfare of the city of Lake Forest by identifying, preserving, protecting, enhancing, and encouraging the continued utilization and rehabilitation of such areas, properties, structures, sites, and objects having a special historical, community, architectural, or aesthetic interest or value to the city of Lake Forest and its citizens. And as Mr. Preschlack, uh, Commissioner Preschlack said, on its face, it's hard for me to imagine anything which could be, uh, well, I'm sure I could if I worked at it, but this looks like it would be really in conflict I'm with- I'm surprised you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> which could be, uh, right, I mean, this looks like it's really in conflict with what we're doing here at its most fundamental level. And I don't think we should be limited to deciding what color we're painting the railing on the Titanic. You know, I think we need to decide whether, uh, in fact, the proposed use is consistent uh, with uh, the character of Lake Forest uh, in this area. And I, I think the, the difference is that the use aspect is covered by the zoning. So it, it is less the use, and, and certainly the, the purpose uh, statement that you just read, I think goes to all of the, the, the visible aspects um, that this, this use would require. So I, I think that's how the link is. It's, it's not the, the use so much. So I, I think if you frame your comments, um, in a way that relate to the visual aspects, I, I think that is your purview. I, well, I think the specific use, whether the use is allowed or not, isn't the jurisdiction of this board, but all the pieces that that use requires certainly relate to the character. So I, I think well, it's, it's and wrapped I, I, together. If I could just close off my comment sure. very quickly. Close away. You say that we're not, uh, we're not allowed to consider use, right? But I mean, as from the language I read to you, right, utilization, right, is at the very core of, uh, of the purpose of uh, the, the historic preservation coordinate, uh, uh, ordinance. And so if, I, I mean, I love donuts, I love coffee, those things are good. But if a use of, uh, of uh, a very important historic property in the center of Lake Forest interferes with the traditional, normal, ordinary utilization that we uh, have, have value, uh, culturally value, I, I, I think that does fall within our purview. And uh, I understand that you disagree, and I just wanted to uh, emphasize my point so your point uh, would be that it's not so much the use that of the of the retail space that you're objecting to it's the preservation of the use of the train station that you're aiming to make sure is not diminished among among other things yes well let me Hard put it in, another way I'm gonna put it this <laughs> way you know um, looking at the plans here the drive-through essentially really changes the character, the historic character of this train station, and it essentially becomes a Dunkin' Donuts as opposed to a historic train station that's at the center of our community. So if we're looking at the character of this building, the historic character, and that's our purview, this drive-through will negatively impact the historic character of this building. So, and I also wanted to mention too that what I find interesting about this is that we've been working so hard to preserve this particular side of this building. It's kind of been ignored for a while, and now um, we've worked so hard, it's the most pedestrian part as opposed to the track. It's the most pedestrian part of the building, and so by putting a drive through there, it becomes, instead of pedestrian-oriented, a pedestrian-oriented character, it becomes an auto, um, automobile-dominated character, which is out of sync with what this building represents historically. So if we look at a historic reason, yeah, I guess you are talking about the usage, and um, a drive-through will negatively impact the historic character of this building, which would mean it's really inappropriate. So, yeah, I, I you know I agree with everything the 
other commissioners have stated, and I hesitate to ask these types of questions, but you know, I, because I, I, I just think this is really out of place. But to uh, Commissioner Athenson's point, you know, we have this drive through on the uh, east side of the building, which really changes the fundamental character. I, I have to ask, although, you know, I'm not advocating for this, has any thought been given, and you mentioned something about the north side of the building making a drive through, you know, a, a, a U turn drive through up to the north side? And, you know, at least the impact is diminished to what is, you know, clearly a focal point to, to downtown and to this community. I mean, it, it's not something I, I'd advocate for, but if Dunkin' Donuts is going in there, why? You know what thought has been given to reconfiguring the parking lot and you know and, and making you know the cars come off of uh, you know come come off of the north side and then exit the north side so at least you know that whole west side or east side of the building isn't dominated. We've spent a, a tremendous amount of time trying to find uh, trying to find a, a balance that being very sensitive to the character. So yes, we've looked at um, changing the parking lot, changing the traffic pattern, a, a drive-through. I, I think the argument for the drive-through uh, that's been presented is that the bank historically had a drive-through here for many years, certainly a different type of use. Um, the canopy was there, which, which never was a good part of this building, uh, but um, Commissioner Ransom, in, in response to your question, we, again, we've, we've worked on this for, for many months, and, and at this point, that's why we're bringing it to you, yeah. um, to, to really get your input and uh, um, to try and move, move this one way or another. I, I I'd frankly would rather see, and again, I hesitate to say this because I, I'm not advocating for it, I would uh, rather see a, a a compatible addition on the north side uh, that you know that made it functional for the drive-through over there than to put the drive-through where it's proposed now because it so dominates the the whole sure. train station. And again, I'm not advocating for that, but I'm you know thinking that would be a preferred solution to what we have here so the context now. of that would be you know we have a historic home in lake forest and somebody wants to add a garage addition to make it functional but they haven't affected the f historic facade the front the impact that would be the the, mm. the similar context yeah, for that kind of a scenario that. and so you know i think it's uh, a, you know we've we've somehow moved from questions to deliberations we have a tendency to do well, that well i'm trying <laughs> trying to give direction no, that I, may, I, may, yeah you know. I, I do want to make sure that we have a, a, a some structure here let's try to get through the q a i know we have some public comments that i'm anxious to hear mm -hmm. and so i'd like to hear about those and then we have an opportunity for more deliberations after that so other questions can i ask one specific question please. yeah and so i look at uh, colors here uh, that are being used and uh, I I know lots and lots of times we spent a lot of time talking about the color palette that's associate to, uh, appropriate for the central business district and I do not believe that these colors were uh, included in that palette and I'm wondering if uh, this is a special exception uh, or whether uh, these colors will be um, in some way made to conform to the color palette, which uh, generally has been considered appropriate for the central business district. This is brought to you for information because we, we have been working on this for a long time. So I think we are looking for your input. We, we have been able to move this signage from uh, frankly, a, a pink and an orange. Um, so we Still are. Left. <laughs> we we are definitely looking for your input. We are not coming to you with a recommendation at this point. Um, so we're we're not trying to make the case that that these are the right colors for the central business district. As far as the signage goes, uh, how how many total number of signs are they are we proposing with this? I just counted up quickly and. You know, do I see an additional 10, 12 signs on, on the property to, I mean, am I, am I off or? There are, are, are many signs proposed and that certainly would be an area that we would 
uh, expect that you would direct us to look at and, and try and uh, min <coughs> mitigate or, or minimize the number of signs. But, but it sounds like, again, that's to my point. I mean, it, it sounds like from the city council's point of view and your conversations with them and, and Bob Kiley that our purview is to critique and make some changes around the character and tone of a, of a project that's moving past us without real authority to say, you know, if you take a step back, this project changes the historical integrity of the structure based on the drive-through, irrespective of the tenant. It doesn't matter who the tenant is. Yeah. And it changes the character of our town, then we have problems with that. So please stop, you know, or please let's rethink this. Uh, is that right? I mean. I and I think that's legitimate. That That is not speaking to the use. The comments you just made sp uh, spoke to the character of the building, the, char the historic character of sure. the area, and, and, and yeah. certainly you're free to give that direction. Yeah, because if a person in our community went on a train downtown to work in 1930, and then there was a time machine, and this was built, and there was a tenant there, it could be a mom pa, it could be a grocery store, whatever, and there's a drive through and there's a fence to stop you from walking out to then be cognizant of a really unsafe area, and then two other pinch points uh, based on the queuing theory, I don't know how it's gonna work, but there's all kinds of safety concerns. The person would be like, wow, what this, it's like almost like it's a wonderful life. You know, when George Bailey goes down the town <laughs> and then and then it's Pottersville. So, I mean, I oh think I think it, it's it's a big change in the character. And that sounds like it is in our purview. So I have a couple of specific questions. Let me throw those out for uh, I, I think some of them might be staff questions. Some of them might be for the petitioner. But uh, Kathy, the drawing that's shown on the screen right now uh, illustrates the kind of the, the anticipated configuration of the new bike uh, location. We saw some earlier um, proposals on that, and I know that that's still being kind of uh, vetted out. But that's that's the seems like the direction that that part of this uh, train station uh, kind of continued adaptation is taking form. Uh, and it looks to me like that configuration precludes the buses from coming all the way to the forward steps. Uh, right now, buses are being staged um, from Westminster all the way to the steps. And then south of the steps, it continues to be parking. That's the cur current configuration today that was always intended to kind of be a temporary configuration. I think that was instigated when we had the golf outing, if you will. So uh, can you just tell us about the buses? Is the intention that the buses will continue to stage somewhere here? How, how are they going to uh, interact with this plan? I just want to understand the, because that's a <laughs> fairly intensive use of um, whatever street that is. There, there is <laughs> an acknowledgement that, that it's likely there will need to be some further change to the bus loading zone. Okay. Um, you're right, that was identified as a temporary location. Yeah. Uh, we met just a few weeks ago with the bus companies. It seems to be working for them, but yeah. it is likely that once the bike path goes in and, and the work um, directly to the east of the station building, some or all of the buses may need to move to the south. To so, so all of that will continue to be looked at um, as, as the changes evolve at the train station. All right, so um, I was mostly concerned with how people get from, you know, and there's quite a few people when that bus, on those buses show up, and particularly when they get off the train and go to the bus, they seem like they go through the station now and out that front door. Um, so that's a pretty good load of people that cross uh, through. You know, I think probably 10 years ago, I would say there's a pretty light load of people that go through the front door of that station, even though it's out the, the east door, I consider the front door. Um, and then it looks to me like the rationale for the location of the menu board is to allow four cars to queue. Mm -hmm. I note that there's no, there's only a single window. There's not a payment window and a pickup window so four cars queuing um, require that must have been a, an operational requirement that drove the signage board further north. Otherwise, you could have maintained the straight out access of the front door, although I understand the safety enhancement of people have to stop. They can't just walk across. Um, but it, I'm, I, I'm, I'm 
curious as to whether that was really considered a, something that made it more safe or whether that was driven by the operational requirement for four cars queuing. The, the location of the menu board is driven by trying to have at least four cars queuing. And okay. in fact, that's one of the issues that the plan commission yeah. identified because if, if we look at some of the numbers um, and talk with engineering, they, they don't feel that four cars queuing is enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not hard yeah. to believe well, given other operations that, you know, everybody goes to Dunkin' Donuts at some point in their life and four cars queuing is, seems to be a yeah. pretty rare opportunity, actually. <laughs> well, yeah, so, so, so if there's five or six <laughs> cars queuing, <laughs> so then the drop-off is totally denied people and they can't turn, and then there'll be people getting upset, and then they'll drive really fast through there, and then if somebody's crossing, they could get hit. There's all kinds of issues operationally. And that's the piece and that's, that the plan commission has yeah. directed us to go back and look at is that queuing area, the circulation <clears throat> area, because that was one of their concerns. So, so it sounds like just I'm trying to read the tea leaves and separate out the um, kind of the emotional response to the impact of this use on the character of the train station with the actual components of the plan which are problematic in that same regard. and. You know the what I would call the um, abomination of the front door. <laughs> That's my words, um, because it, it no longer becomes the focal energy of the center. You know, you have a fence in front of it. You're forcing circulation in a different direction, and you're putting a signage board in front of it or to immediately to the left of it. I say that that's a fairly um, strong uh, negative part of the proposal in terms of trying to maintain any sense of character of the train station building. I think we give some agreement on that. Mm -hmm. um, the um, garbage location, it's now I'm somehow gone from questions to uh, do that. But no, they want our direction. Yeah, so. so the garbage enclosure, I guess I could ask it as a question. It seems like it's already been answered. This is the only place you could find for the garbage enclosure. Maybe it could be located inside the building. That would probably be. Why not be, off site? Why does uh, it have to be right next to the building? Why not? The other question I had. You know, yeah, why not put it inside the building or somewhere else? But I mean, that, I think what's what's um, you know particularly if you remove the front door of this building, the north end of it becomes the front door for at least fifty percent of the people arriving at this location, uh, including me every day, and. You know, I didn't really think the bikes were very attractive. The garbage enclosure is really in, unattractive. So I'd say that that's kind of a really, uh, if anybody were to propose that kind of a location for their garbage on their home, we would say, no, you can't do that. Don't do that. Come back with us with a better solution. Um, so at least those, at least those specific areas of the plan seem like they're um, tough. Now, that's not without getting into like the different elevations you've got to, a 10-foot drive-through lane and a 9-foot remaining lane at different elevations with a, what is going to be particularly weak landscaping strip between how do you plow a 10-foot lane that's got a barrier bar, you know, how do you maintain those plantings? Those are, those are difficult things. Um, Still a question, please. Sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was asking questions. myself a question. You know, I tell you what. Why can if, just have a if, few more questions? Okay, for sorry. Just a, two quick ones. First of all, that window that they're removing is that um, original wood and glass? Yes. So that was the original when. Oh, so that is really historically significant. Yes. Okay. Um, that's your that's your original wood and glass. Holy. I God. believe so. Wow. Cool. Okay. And then. Um, you know, Kathy, I have to ask you this because this reminds me of a, several years ago when we were looking at a drive-through for Caputo's, which is now, well, it was No-No's back then. And I think this wasn't HPC. It must have been ABRB. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, we did. And we looked at it, and we considered it was inappropriate. It was out of character with that area. And that was um, on Wisconsin Avenue and had a significantly more room. It was off a road and yet we said that was inappropriate. So I'm just wondering, you know, that's not as historically significant as this train station is. Yeah. What's uh, the difference here? What's the change? Well, I think it's, uh, it was well done by John uh, kind of just describing the difference between our purview over the use, and if you read the, the zoning ordinance, and I did this, for the plan commission and what standards they have to consider a new use, they're very parallel to what we have to consider. But it's not our purview, it's their purview for the use. However, 
for the existing building, it is completely our purview to protect the character. But back then, that Caputo's, it and was the about of, the character. It no, was understand, about but the building, and that's what our purview was at the time. So for the, it wasn't it wasn't about the use; it was about the character. So, and we said it was not inappropriate. Yeah. yeah. So that's why yeah. I'm wondering what's the difference? What's the change in yeah. thought process here when we have a more significantly historical building? Well, I'm not sure we need the protection of commenting on the use. We certainly have the protection of commenting on the existing character of the building. So, um, okay. other questions before we go to public testimony? I promise I'll let you pontificate at least as much as I did. <laughs> per. Any public testimony? Please come on up, introduce yourself for the folks at home, and we'll we'd love to hear what you have to say. My name is Celine Meeks. I moved to Lake Forest in 1976. I live at 65 Farnham Lane. I only learned about this meeting today so that um, my comments are going to be somewhat disjointed due to that. So I beg your pardon for that. I looked when I first came in here, because I'm a, li a librarian, at the precedent for um, Dunkin' Donuts at train stations. And uh, a lot of information came up about that, a lot of it negative in, in, in relation to this company. Uh, there is quite a range in um, fast food companies. And I don't think it would be uh, going out on a limb to say that Dunkin' Donuts is probably not at the top of that range. Uh, probably closer to the lower end of that as far as the company is concerned and the product that they provide. Um, a quick survey of family and friends uh, was definitely negative on this, um, but I didn't ask my granddaughter, who is a high school student, who probably would love to run down to Dunkin' Donuts at, at lunchtime and run back to class. Um, one of the things that came out just in today's paper is that it's been a decline of 10% in obesity in our children. Um, this is not a product that would, uh, would lend itself to that trend. And I would think that Lake Forest would not be, want to be behind a project that would, would um, tend to attract students to eat foods that are, are really not very good for them. Um, uh, when you talk about pedestrians, uh, pedestrians take the path of least resistance. So, you know, they are going to be running for a train. They are going to be, you know, <laughs> not really looking at the uh, foliage. I mean, if you look at the, um, the Sheridan Road, uh, not the Sheridan Road, the uh, Fort Sheridan Station years ago, I mean, people would just clip the, uh, the uh, you know, fencing that was there to get across the train station. So, and also, this is a very tight area. There is not much room here as far as space is concerned. And to put something right up against this building seems, uh, from a safety point of view, as extremely um, um, wrong. I mean, I, I just, when I saw this up on the, the board here, I thought, heavens, that's, that's extraordinarily unsafe. So there are a lot of things that mitigate against this uh, particular plan. Um, and I've just, um, you know, brought a, a few of them. I mean, Lake Forest has just managed to get rid of Burger King to take on D Dunkin' Donuts seems to be going in the wrong direction. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it a little bit to, to others to talk about um, more about this. But w w I'll just mention in closing that the Pasquazes is, is a uh, local business and that, that's, a, that's not a, an intensive use there. I think that a Dunkin' Donuts would give competition of, not of a negative kind to, uh, to our Starbucks, to our other coffee shops in Lake Forest that are good, good citizens. Um, and the last thing we want to do is give people um, this kind of competition in, in, a, in a historic area like this, uh, people who are working at their businesses right now. So with that, I'll close and thank you.
Thank you. Other comments from the public, if there are any? from 725 McKinley immediately across the street from the from the uh, proposed uh, uh, from the station itself and I'm, I'm somewhat ambivalent about whether or not you have Dunkin Donuts there uh, certainly be nice to be able to get coffee quickly and donuts um, and I know that you have a need or the city has a need to encourage businesses uh, of all types in this day and age um, uh, you've lost an awful lot of um, businesses in Market Square, etc. Et cetera. Um, uh, down the street, the, the Burger King is gone, and uh, the King Maw restaurant is gone um, for various reasons. But um, my main concern is the fact that, and it might be very unpopular, uh, the pathway across the tracks at the station uh, really miss that ability to cross there. And I have seen uh, during this season, this snow season, people having to go either to Deer Path or to Westminster, and as they attempt to cross the tracks at those two locations, due to the fact that the trains have been pushing snow as they go by, it's very slippery, it's uh, a lot of slush and, and uh, snow there, um, people rushing, uh, effectively having to go two blocks from the time they get an enunciation that a train is uh, imminent, and they make their way uh, across, particularly if it's a northbound train, and they're coming out of the eastbound the east side station. So I'd very much like to see that pathway reopened. I have attempted uh, to send information to the vil to the city, uh, and was referred to Metra, and Metra referred me to Union Pacific, and I had at least five interchanges with an Adrian Guerrero at. Um, Union Pacific telling me, we'll never reopen that, it's a safety issue. And I said, well, you've never had a safe, safety incident in that general vicinity. And uh, they have been very adamant. that. So I, my thoughts are, if a business like this or any other business wanted to move into that uh, train station, that it would be to their uh, benefit to have the pathway across the tracks reopened. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, please. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rami Lopat, and I live at 410 East Woodland Road. Um, Dunkin' Donuts is an iconic brand. And, you know, just looking at me, you can tell that I'm quite partial to their product, their high quality product. In fact, I was kind of hoping that there would be some of that product here for the audience tonight. Oprah Winfrey would have done that. But a missed opportunity there. Uh, it's a opportunity. <laughs> know your audience. Nonetheless, let me say that I am far more partial um, to, to our own high quality product, our train station here in Lake Forest. Indeed, Market Square and the train station exemplify Lake Forest's own iconic brand. Our adherence to the tradition of doing everything possible to preserve at extremely high levels of quality our historic treasures, our historic visual character. In fact, the city has spent millions of dollars in the past couple of years working on this train station through a grant written by the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation and the city staff, and we have millions more dollars to spend yet on painting this fabulous building. Um, I just can't believe that Dunkin' Donuts, with all due respect, um, just blew it on this. You d didn't get Lake Forest history. If it, Commissioner, you just asked the previous petitioner for a historic certification report on a marginal building. You should have run out, and you can still run out and get a historic architect. One worked on this building over the last two years, Gunny Harbo, famous guy in Chicago. Go get him. Get some help on this. 
We would love to see these two iconic brands, Lake Forest and Dunkin' Donuts, figure out a way of creating historic preservation awesome. to do adaptive reuse. I can't see it. I can't understand how this drive-through works on this historic building, but there may be a way. I don't think it's happened between the staff and the, and the business at this point, but that doesn't mean much. We can keep going and work it out. Um, the signage, the fencing, the minimal landscaping, no three Carl Forst Forster grass in the median does not work. Um, just the height clearance bar, trying to figure that out against this building, ooh, terrible. Um, and then all the ancillary signage. And, and certainly for the plan commission, I would say, I don't even understand how parking's gonna work. Never mind the drive-through, if you wanna go in and buy a dozen donuts, where are you gonna park your car? So um, so there's a lot to be considered before this goes forward, but, um, but I certainly see, I think that if you go back to the drawing bo board, work it a little harder, maybe these two iconic brands can see, can see something mutual. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other comments from the public, please? Grace, do you a piece? My name is Tom Cranes, and I live at uh, Westminster McKinley. Um, aside from the Dunkin' Donuts, I'll start out with the, uh, the buses. Um, whoever made a decision, it's not a good decision. It's uh, very loud in the morning at 6 in the morning. It's a lot of diesel smell, and you have residents right there across the street. Um, it should have been at least on the south end because there's parking all on the south end, and um, even the church doesn't even have people living there. So I think that needs to be addressed. Um, with the Dunkin' Donuts plan, I, I, I really concur with uh, Mr. Preschlack and the, and the rest of the commissioners that you're making this train station, a, um, you might as well, the city might as well uh, sell the naming rights to the station and just call it Dunkin' Donuts, put a big thing on the roof, because you, you're literally taking a historic building and making the whole parking lot and the building Dunkin' Donuts. And I do not agree with that at all. I, I came to this city. Uh, it's a beautiful city. When you think of Lake Forest, you think of peace, you think of uh, nature. Um, and the city, the community prides itself on the historic um, charm of, of this city. And you're, you're taking this building in the center of the city and you're making it uh, commercial. And I, if Dunkin' Donuts wants to be inside and have like a little bronze sign on the outside, that's great. But I think to do a uh, drive-through and to put signage everywhere and a, a speaker, and, and you have four cars there, but what about all the people? Where are they gonna go? They're gonna be backing up, and then you have people that are gonna try to go into the parking spots. They can't go. You're gonna create traffic congestion going towards uh, a deer path. I, I, I think this is a bad move, and if the city wants tax revenue so much, I think they need to look at other ways of getting it. All right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Other public comments? Huh. My name is Ruth Brueggemann. I live at 55 Farnham Lane, also in Lake Forest, but I am here to represent the congregation of the church that is directly opposite this train station and the residence that we own that is directly opposite this train station. Um, I concur with the residents on the corner. The noise level uh, of the city living on that corner, I used to live there for 25 years till we tore the house down, is escalated beyond what you can even imagine, and I don't think too many people live downtown anymore. I am concerned, the congregation is concerned about the Sunday morning traffic, about the noise level of the speaker, of this communication going back and forth between the cars and the uh, people inside taking orders. Uh, we have an ongoing issue with parking in our parking lot that we're always trying to monitor and control. Um, I don't know where all of these additional motorists driving through to buy product here uh, are going to, 
how this is all going to work with the traffic that's already current. Um, we don't have any hours of operation listed anywhere. We would really appreciate not having additional Sunday morning traffic and noise right there. Um, our building is not air conditioned. When we open windows on Sunday morning, and the noise is almost more than can be overcome uh, through service. And we, you know, we're very happy members of the community. We're happy to do whatever we need to do. I think we've um, accommodated and continue to accommodate. Uh, but we would like to just, I don't even know if I'm at the right meeting, but we would like to just offer that as um, residence next door. The house next door to the church is used for senior housing, um, and they also use open windows in the summer and things like that. So the noise level is, is a sincere consideration for an operation like this. I'm all for, for business, and I think um, they have to have a revenue return that makes it possible for them to do what they need to do in this space. But I would really like to voice um, objection to the drive-through window. So thank you very much. Thank you. Other comments from the public? Do I see any? Thanks, everybody, for coming out uh, to give us public comments. I know it's a cold and blustery night, and uh, we do appreciate that. I think in the spirit of Kathy's kind of data and information collection function this evening, um, part of what we're doing here is we're trying to carry back a message, you know, to give some guidance to folks who are certainly going to be watching this. And I would just um, encourage folks at home uh, to use the email. Kathy likes to hear from you too, and if there's comments, uh, oh, you know, whether in they're in support or not in support, or if they're bringing up issues that we haven't thought about. And I think, thank you for the, the speaker issue. That's something I hadn't really thought about. I don't know if it's a problem or not, but it's certainly something to consider. Um, so I would encourage you to, to share those <coughs> thoughts with Kathy. Uh, now's an opportunity for commissioners to deliberate or to give <coughs> any further kind of closing comments. We're not going to make any motions or anything tonight, so I would, maybe we can wrap it up in the next mm -hmm. few minutes here. I think the general tenor of the discussion has kind of been revealed, um, but it's not, nevertheless, you might have some thoughts. Well, I just want to reiterate that, you know, this is, this east side is the front door of this station, and it's the one that we've been working so hard to preserve and upgrade and make more of a focal point. So, um, you know, just the drive through is really incompatible with the historic um, character of this building. I don't know if you want to go through the specific elements or? Uh, it's your opportunity. So I think, you know, Kathy's been taking a lot of notes. I think that that's the good thing. Um, so it's up to you, whatever you want. To. Right, well, I'll just go through the individual ones and just skip over the ones that have been already reiterated. But now we know that that's the original glass and window. It's a historic window, and you're going to compromise it with um, aluminum and tempered glass. That obviously is not compatible with the historic nature of this building. Um, we're, we're here to preserve the building and preserve the historic character. And you know, the petitioner said that wood's not going to work, so that option is not viable if we're trying to preserve the historic character of this building. Um, See, I think you made some other things. The railing, once again, is blocking the front door of the station. That's incompatible with the historic nature of this building. It will com compromise the historic integrity of this building. It's the front door. This is where all the pedestrians go through. It's not just a, you know, a side door that's crossing the driveway. Um, and you know, this is a very pedestrian-oriented side of the building. That's the character of this side of the building is pedestrian in nature, pedestrian dominated, not auto dominated. Other sides of the building are more auto uh, dominated. So we are changing the character of this historic building once again by adding these cars and putting a gate in front of the front door. Um, and the gate is not going to solve the safety issues. I know that's for the plan commission, but the safety issues are just you know, crazy here in terms of pedestrians running into cars. Um, the signage, obviously, we said is way too much. A little tiny sign is usually what we would require for a business, not something this giant. On uh, Deer Path or Westminster, eight, ten signs is really overdoing it. Two colors only, no pink, no green, nothing. Um, and that's what we require of all businesses within Market Square. So um, reduce signage, reduce the <coughs> amount of it, minimal signage, just to identify the business. Um, not 
directional signage. The menu board is really an issue. You place it right before a historic window, um, so that compromises, once again, the historic integrity of this building. Um, not to mention that you're blocking the light to a business that's already there. Um, and what else? Oh, the trash enclosure. You gotta find a better place for this. It has to be off-site. It can't be, you know, that's the, that's the entrance where you see coming off Westminster, and you don't want that to be the focal point. Um, so the trash enclosure, there's gotta be a better location. Move it away from the building where it's less obtrusive and out of the way of this historic view. Let's see, anything else? So I think I've kind of summed up, and hopefully I wasn't redundant with what the other comments you said because I agreed with everything else you said. <clears throat> Thanks, Sid. Yeah. Any other deliberations from any folks? I'll just take the moment really quick to reinforce, I think it was John, uh, the, the frustration of losing the crossing. I'm sure that the city didn't get a vote in that. I know that there's lots and lots of communities who share that frustration. That was a very convenient way for us to um, go from one side, and I, I, I do that because I commute every morning, so every evening and every morning. Um, I don't know if there's anything that the city could do, but it, I'll use my bully pulpit to encourage them if they could. Uh, that'd be, uh, you know, we went so far in, I think, another venue to talk about connections from Lake Forest to Portions East, and um, that was a primary kind of uh, way for that uh, connection to occur, and so that was a that was a, an important loss uh, for this train station. Uh, bus traffic, a, a similar kind of thing. We're not really talking about it tonight, but you can see how, how much of an issue it is for folks who live adjacent to those buses. Perhaps there's a way to decentralize all of that. You know, I think when you put them all in one spot, they become an issue. When you spread them out, maybe operationally it's not as easy, but it doesn't have the same kind of impact as six buses idling on the mm -hmm. curb or even 10 buses idling on the curb. So it's something to consider um, when you're talking about you know, ways to make this better. Yeah. Um, Jim, it sounds like you've Yeah, I just things. wanted to add one thing, because I think this is, I, I, I know this is how I feel, and I know I think I could speak for the other commissioners. I mean, to me, the biggest resistance point is the drive-through. It's totally tenant ind independent. It doesn't matter who is in there, what, it could be an Hermes scarf shop. It, 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 it's, it's all about the historical integrity of the building. The drive-through is, is what's driving everything in terms of signage and speaker and other things. So it's, it's the long pole in the tent. And uh, I'd be more than happy to have a, a vibrant business, um, you know, Dunkin' Donuts or anybody else in that space, but it's the drive-through that's, that's the real showstopper. And it, it violates the spirit of the town, the brand of the town, I think, um, was a nice way to put it. But, but, more, but, but most importantly, the historic integrity of this structure. So that's... I just want to make sure that's really clear because yeah. it has nothing to do with the tenant. Well, and I, I would just kind of close, unless somebody else has any comments, uh, just I'd be um, remiss not to mention the, the nice memo that the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation penned on this uh, issue, really supporting continued retail use, but pointing out the, um, the problems with respect to this uh, per specific drive-through operation and, you know, um, you guys can read this yourself, but I, I, I think reading it closely is, uh, it, it was well done. I think it echoes a lot of the same kind of concerns that we're talking about. And again, it's the, not, not here to disparage Dunkin' Donuts, sorry for not giving you guys too much opportunity. Um, it's not really about you, it's about the character of the building and how do we maintain the character of the building. So I'll give you an opportunity to talk there. Please. It looks like you'd like one, so. Yeah, Commissioner, hi, my name is Kareem Koja. I'm the uh, franchisee. Um, I own majority of the stores in Lake County and Northern Cook County and few in downtown. And uh, we've built stores in great neighborhoods like Lake Forest. Um, recently opened one in Lincolnshire. We're opening one in Northfield. Um, took, a, took a long time to get a drive through approved in Northfield. Um, we own uh, Highland Park. We just redid Deerfield. Uh, we, we're, we're, on a, we're opening one in downtown Highland Park, actually, with the drive through um, Some of the comments made by the public were I think unfair and I'll just leave it at that. I hope you understand. Um, we're not a second class citizen. Um, I hope that was not, you know, it was Dunkin' Donuts is, and we've changed a lot. I'll be honest with you. I, I've been in part of the business since I was seven years old. I remember, you know, when my father was a baker, uh, first store in Waukegan, Illinois, you know, in Lake County. And, uh, you know, we were 99% donut business back in 1981 and 1% soup business. 
Uh, today, as we stand in 2014, we are 16% uh, donut business, 70% coffee. So we are looking after the health of America. Um, donut consumption has been on a downtrend, and, and it's good because we don't make any money in donuts. Uh, quite frankly, it's unfortunate, but our name has donuts in it, and it will always have donuts in it. But if I could sell zero donuts, I would be a very happy person. Um, our business has gone into more sandwiches, bagels, bagel and cream cheese, um, and coffee, and espresso, and beverages. And there's a lot of things I could have said tonight that I didn't. I'd held back. Um, being in the business for 30 years, I can speak a lot about the business, but I, think, I don't think that this is the right venue for talking about my business and what we've done. I think um, it's about, you know, I've opened stores in high-end communities without a drive through in the past, and I will never do it again. Um, I think the number one reason your Burger King left, and I'm speaking only as a business person here, I'm taking out my, I'm, I'm putting on my business hat, and I'm taking out my uh, petitioner hat for a second. I think the only reason the Burger King left is they didn't have a drive through um, and we're not a fast food. I hope you guys understand that. We are a coffee house, and I have every statistic to prove that we are a coffee house, so people n can stop noting us as a fast food restaurant. Uh, 30 years ago, yes, we, we, we were a donut shop. Today, we are a coffee shop, and if you look at some of the stores that I've built, and I can give you all 44 addresses, some of them are very unique. Um, if you go inside the one in Highland Park, it's changed its look. Um, we recently put almost a million dollars into our Deerfield location. It's got 80 seats. Walk in there and see the difference that what Dunkin' Donuts is today. It's, it, it's totally different than what it was even five years ago. Um, so going back to the use, I, I want to preface that you can either work with us and we can work together and get this thing done, and I'm hoping we can because we've spent almost a year on this project, and, and, and I'm sorry that no one in this town heard about this till today. Um, we, you know, th one of the reasons why we petitioned to go into this location is because there was a drive through here for 30 years. And as a business person, you would think, okay, you've had a drive through here for 30 years. We're adding a drive through keeping it a drive through not, we're not changing it um, any bit. And understand our business, it, it's 70% it's of our business gets done in a certain time period of the day. Other than that, no one comes to us. Um, parking, there, there was parking for the bank. There is parking for us. The interior will be very historical. We will leave every element of the inside as it is today, including the bank original tellers, which I have to fight corporate on. We will leave that. Um, the window, we will take the piece of window out that's historical. We will save that window. So the day when we leave, we, will, we have plans to put the window back exactly where it is today. That was thought out already. Um, as far as the window and we will address the window issue. We will address the safety issues But if we walked in here then when, and, and with all the negative connotation that's been going on in the last two hours We're not gonna go anywhere um, And I'd like to work with everybody in this room Whatever the concerns are we will address if I have to hire an historian we will hire an historian um, If I have to hire whoever I have to hire we will hire um, We have traffic engineers safety consultants. We've already hired um I hope I don't have to hire an attorney because that's not the way I want to do this. Um, I really want to work with you guys and get, get this through. I mean, if the signage is an issue, then the signage is an issue. I understand. If it's too much signage, tell us what's wrong with it and we'll fix it. Tell us where you want the garbage can. I, I, you know, we'll put the garbage can where you want the garbage can. Th th that place was only picked because it was the logical place to go. But I understand if it's not the right place to put it, Let's put it where you guys feel it's the right place to put it. But give us some direction. Just don't say it's not the right place to put it. T where should it be? You know, t tell us where it should it be. So um, just to wrap up, and I'm not going to um, continue to have a debate here. Um, we are not disparaging the use. Uh, we had some comments from the public about the use, but we're not up here disparaging the use. We're talking about how to preserve the character of this building and the, w how the drive-through operation, the signage board, the relocation, dislocation of the entrance to the building, the drive-through window, the overhead bar, the change of the traffic circulation that causes a raise of elevation across the front of the building and the trash enclosure. Think all of those kinds of items, how they compound the difficulties of maintaining the character 
of one of the premier buildings in Lake Forest. So sure. that's what we're here to talk about. Um, I can't expect that anyone would have really walked into this room thinking that the Historic Preservation Commission of Lake Forest would have been um, welcoming a change like this to an important building like this with open arms. So I, understand. I'm, I, I doubt anybody's surprised by our uh, anybody is surprised by the knee jerk, you know, by the by the reaction that we're having to this. So it's guidance. It's all it is. Um, you know, uh, can you fix it? You, I don't know. We're, we we very seldom fix problems. We only just point out the the shortcomings of designs or things that we think that we would need to have attended to before we could give them support. And so, uh, whether the other uh, important commissions, boards. Um, City Council takes our uh, collective wisdom into account. Remains to be seen. Um, but, but understand, I'm, I'm here to work with everybody. I understand. I'm not here to. Yeah. And once again, it's not animosity. the donuts. Animosity. <laughs> yeah, I'm not here to even sell donuts. Um, it's it's really not the donuts. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, with that, I will ask the staff if there's any uh, final comments or information for the end of the meeting or the public. Um, I, I think we we do uh, we certainly can meet and talk through what we've heard tonight sure. and and explore ways to try and address concerns Absolutely. Um, and I know we've we've tried to do that and we'll we'll certainly continue to try and do that but we have heard your concerns and uh, um, I agree it's it's not a surprise so mm -hmm. I, I think uh, they they have been helpful and point us in in the direction we need to continue to explore I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there is one other opportunity for the public to address the Historic Preservation, Preservation Commission on non-agenda items. If anyone has one, it looks like there is one. So Rami, please come on up and uh, let us know what your non-agenda item is. <laughs> Thank you. On a lighter note. This time I'm Rami Lopat and um, I'm representing the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation. Commissioner Athenson, could I ask you to take some of these to distribute? Uh, we wanted to make sure that you are aware of and that you are invited to um, uh, one of our next educational seminars. It's going to be held on Sunday, March the 9th, and it's at the Lake Forest Library to celebrate the architecture of Edwin Hill Clark. You may know that he designed the library, <laughs> as well as um, the Grove Campus and, and many, and probably at least a dozen homes in Lake Forest, some of our most notable homes. Um, for example, the Thorne Estate at the corner of Broad, Broadsmoor and Ridge, magnificent home. Um, 1000 Illinois, 1200 North Green Bay Road, um, 6 East uh, Laurel and the coach house there right on the corner of Green Bay and Laurel. Um, and I could go on 855 East Westminster as a matter of fact. This is going to be a slide presentation by architect Tom, historic architect Tom Rakovich. And um, after that, on, in April, uh, we have a daytime program on stained glass windows in um, Lake Forest. And then uh, in April, we have our annual meeting at which we give awards for historic preservation to um, building owners and residential owners. And we kick off, as you probably know, May is National Historic Preservation Month. So stay tuned. Please come. We'd love to see you. And uh, we welcome um, lots and lots of people. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. Any other non-agenda items? I will entertain a motion, if there is one, to a motion to uh, adjourn. adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Motion's been made. Uh, is there a second? Second. And seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Good night. <laughs>